no matter what type of movie it is, needs to have an opening that grabs you. I almost always know the endings. Oh, I'm writing. Where's this gonna go? The first week, you don't even investigate structure. In every story, there are two plot points. My outlines are about 25 pages to 30 pages long. When I would take baths, being submerged in water made me think of ideas. Allow it to come out of your heart and onto the page. That I used to just jump right into it and start trying to write it, which is not the best way of doing it. We needed this three months ago, and you're still just kind of wandering in the weeds. As a writer, if you're writing and not getting the results you want, what writers do is they either quit or they just double down and keep writing scripts thinking, well, you gotta be in the right place at the right time. And they keep writing and they create a pile of similarly flawed scripts. Process, process, process. You have to improve your process. The great Bruce Springsteen needed an adjustment in process. So who can do that for you? Managers can do that for you, uh, mentors, writers, or if you don't have the money or you don't have the time, uh, you're fortunate to live in a time when there's so much free digital content. So you can go back and watch, if you haven't already, a lot of Film Courage videos. You can also go to podcasts. And there are a lot of writers who talk about their process. Now, it's really important that you don't just find a writer that you love and say, oh, I'm gonna do her process. No, no, no. There is a process that allows Tina Fey to write to the best of her ability. There's a process that allows, you know, Greta Gerwig to write to the best of her ability. That's not the process that's gonna allow you to write. You gotta find your process. I am not smart enough to look at your writing and talk to you and know what process is gonna work best for you. You're not smart enough to know. You have to experiment. I will tell you this, most writers' default process holds them back. Most writers' default process plays to their strengths and hides their weaknesses. And if you keep doing that, your weaknesses get weaker and your strengths get stronger. Again, if you have some time and energy, listen to the Film Courage videos, listen to podcasts, listen to very successful writers, they'll talk about their process. So you could start to collect lots of different writers' processes and you could start playing with some of those and experimenting with some of those. Find seven writers that you really respect that, that talk about their process. Not all writers do, but a lot of writers do because there's so much you know, uh, interviews out there. So find at least seven writers that you respect who share their process and write down what their process is. And then what I want you to do is look at those processes, those seven processes, and say, which one do I think is gonna work best for me? And then which one would I be most excited to try? It might be the same one, might be a different one. And then, okay, which one do I know isn't gonna work for me? There's no way. Start with that one. Start with that one. Because writers, I always tell writers this, either you control your process or your process controls you. The first important thing about your process is recognizing that it's yours, that there is not a right or wrong way um, some people write at night, some people write in the day, some people write in short bursts, some people write in long extended bursts. It, it's, there's no particular better or worse process. The important thing about a process is it's something that you can do relatively easily. For whatever reason, it works for you. And that means you have to spend time paying attention to yourself, trying different things and seeing which ones work and which ones don't work and being really honest about that. I will say one thing that I think could be very interesting to people uh, that are writers is, is um, what I do is I outline a script very meticulously and my outlines are about 25 pages to 30 pages long. And then when I go to write the actual first draft, I will not reread one word of what I've written until I've written the whole script. So for my first pass on a screenplay, I start from the beginning and then I just go. And I go all the way through until I'm done without having read one word of it. And it takes about three weeks. So in three weeks, I've written a whole draft and it's a lot of fun because there is no judgment whatsoever. <laughs> I'm just writing straight through. And then I go through and very meticulously work through the scenes. Um, and that takes two to three weeks. And then in six weeks, I have a draft 
but it's really two drafts because I've done one straight through and then one this sort of meticulous work through. And I will say that the second phase of it, the meticulous work through phase, is uh, the least enjoyable part of the whole process because it's the most critical where I just, for a couple weeks, it's just I have to work through these scenes and, and, uh, and then, but I just do it. And then after that, I have a draft to work off of. And then there's many drafts after that, but it's, a, it's I have this nice foundation. I start with somewhat of an outline. Um, I need to know where I am and then where I'm going or where I just came from. So usually for me personally, um, when I'm starting to write, it's not coming from a, a, from a starting place. It's coming from a scene I already had. So I write that scene out. The most vivid thing about what I think about this idea, I write that scene out without any, it doesn't have to fit anywhere, I don't know where this is, but I just see these characters doing this at some point. So I start there, kind of kind of get my groove going and start to like, yeah, I really feel this moment, I've seen this moment, I'm very a very visual writer and a very, uh, when ideas come to me, they come to me almost as like a movie. Um, so I'm able to write that down and then now, I go to an outline because I don't I don't even know where this is. So I know I'm here, but I don't know where this is in the story or anything like that. Um, so I just start with, okay, where's it ending? Where are we going? And then go from there. So I kind of, in a very non-linear way, <laughs> bounce about the outline. And then in the end, which the outline could take two months. I mean, in the end, I see it and I'm like, okay, now this is some type of map with the understanding that we can deviate from it. It's just throwing ideas around at first. And Chris Bergash, who co-wrote Starlet and Tangerine, he's wonderful at you know note taking. So he's there typing away, just compiling every note possible into something. I don't know even know what he's typing. What you know, simple text or something. And he's just compiling all these notes. So the first day is really just us brainstorming, spitballing ideas. Uh, that's really hard to say because it it's over the course of many months you know so i i i think there there's a point where there are enough notes down on page and you you understand your story enough where it's time to start writing those pages so uh, i might write a page he'll write a page we'll start sharing them i know that we used uh for both films i think we used google drive and we were sharing a lot that way you know, we also go about it where we eventually get to a point where we we have the um, the post-its on the wall, oh. and that that that's when you when you actually can get a film or your idea or your you know your script um, up on the wall and like with hundreds of post-its and it makes sense from beginning to end, I think that's when we decide to start assigning each other pages and scenes. So we'll say, okay, look at that scene. I think I got a handle on that scene. I'll take that. Can you take that one? Because I don't have a handle on that one. And then we, we share them and then we start to compile this thing. And uh, that's, how that's, that's how that's done. <laughs> I almost always know the endings of every one of these movies before we even set down the road to you know to start breaking it breaking it out point by point i mean i knew the ending of starlet i knew the ending of tangerine i know the ending of the next film um so that's because i just i i think endings are very important to me um prince same goes for prince of broadway and takeout so with all of them i knew the ending was almost more important than the beginning this is the first time I'm thinking about this sort of stuff, so, so uh, I haven't been asked these questions before. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's actually I focus more on the last scene and the impact the last scene will have. That's almost one of the first things I think about. You know, with Tangerine, it was the only thing we thought about when I went to, you know, to start our research process. Um, Chris Bergash and I uh, went to the corner of Santa Monica and Highland and we started introducing ourselves to people, et cetera, you know, just telling them what we we're going to do. When we finally found Maya and Kiki, I said, I only have like a few ideas here. And one of them is, well, first off, uh, uh, it has to take place on one day because we have a limited budget and costume changes cost money and continuity costs money. It's easier to shoot in a, tw in a, a film that takes place in a 24 hour period of time. The second one is that I think people are coming together or someone's trying to find somebody else or whether that's a love story or a revenge story, I don't know. 
And the third is this ending. I know I can see the ending. I can see all my characters converging at the end at donut time in a big climactic scene. Those were the only things I saw going into it. So it's funny. Yeah, it's funny you say. It's funny you bring that up. The endings are very important to me because it's about how the audience leaves the theaters. You know, I, 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 I think very much so about the impact of that last scene. If you think, uh, I look at my favorite films, and my favorite films are like uh, Harold and Maude, and when he's walking away at the end after, you know, the, the car goes over the cliff and you think he might be in it, but then he's up on the cliff and he's with his, his banjo. Uh, you have, um, you know, some, most of my favorite films have such um, incredibly memorable, lasting scenes that have an impact on the audience as they're sitting there during the final credits, and I think, that that's something I'm always conscious of. It's, 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 it's the most important thing for me in a screenplay. I don't really like outlining. Um, that's not, if it, I have my druthers, I don't, oh, sorry, I'm hitting my mic. If I have my druthers, I don't outline. I just tear into it and I start from the beginning. And there are times where I will skip a section if I feel like it's um, gonna slow me down or I don't know how to address it yet. And I'll go to the next section with the idea of I'm gonna come back around. Um, but I usually start with a big beginning. You know, I feel like every screenplay, no matter what type of movie it is, needs to have an opening that grabs you. Um, and so that's usually what I start with. What's the essence of this film? What is the, what would the opening sequence that would satisfy a super fan of whatever this movie is, right? If, it, if, it's, a, uh, if it's a drama, if it's an action movie, that's where I start, just the beginning. Try to open with a bang. I always think of James Bond movies. They always open with an action sequence in the middle, usually in the middle of what's happening. So that the the people in the movie theater are kind of catching up, you know, in the, the opening three or four minutes of like, who's the bad guy? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And I just try to do that for every type of movie. Um, yeah, that's where I start, right at the beginning. <laughs> movie ideas don't come to me as an idea. I, I have like a flash and I see the entire movie. And so like I know every single beat of that movie. Like it'll like a flash in my mind and I'm like, so this scene happens and this scene happens. I know the full story. When the idea comes, I know the entire story. It's not like, well, what if this happened and then that happened? Like I know the entire story. And like I knew every single scene and every single moment I even saw shots in my head for some of my movies that like right when I had the idea and it just comes in flashes. It's, it's really weird. Um, uh, I used to, I used to say, I think cause I'm a Pisces, I used to say that like when I would take baths, being submerged in water made me think of ideas. I always loved water. I liked swimming, all that stuff. Also really creepy that I believe in that because my favorite food is sushi. So like I like eating fish, which is weird. But uh, <laughs> I think finding that like that Zen moment and then when I clear my mind and I think of nothing, something fills it with like some random idea. When I went to work with, with uh, Michael McDowell on Beetlejuice, uh, we had been working for a couple of weeks and he sat down with me and he said, Larry, this is not working out. This is not happening. And I was taken aback and I said, why? What do you mean? He said, because you're just sitting around waiting for inspiration and I don't work like that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit around waiting for, for you to be inspired. If you're going to work with me, and Michael was as professional writer as I had ever met. He had published, I don't know, 19, 20 novels, horror novels, genre, genre, great genre novels. He had written for a show called Tales from the Dark Side. He was the real deal. And, 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 and not, a, Not, not, a, not, a, not, not a person to, to hold back his feelings, <laughs> okay? Um, and, he, and, he, and again, he said to me, this is just not happening. And he, and he said, and this, this was the most, this changed my, my life as a writer. He said, if you're gonna work with me, look at it like we're working in a bank. We get in at nine, 
we have a cup of coffee, we say good morning, we, we, then we go to work. And we, work. and we write until lunch, we go have our lunch, we come back, we write again until around three o'clock in the afternoon, we fold up the writing, we return whatever phone calls, whatever business of writing we have to do, and we do this five, six days a week. And, we're, and, and, and it's a job. It's, it's, it's not you sitting in a, with a metaphorical beret in a metaphorical loft waiting for inspiration to strike. It's a job. And it was a bit of tough love and it took me aback. Uh, uh, and and I was, I, I suppose, a tiny bit offended. But then, then the thing he said to me that sealed the deal, because I, when I was working at Paramount, I was writing script notes. Again, it was, it was like a 16-hour day often, and, and probably 14 of those hours a day was writing script notes. And he said, Larry, you've told me you've written hundreds of pages of notes for other people's scripts. Why can't you do it for yourself? And I was like, wow, okay, I will try it your way. And it changed my perception of who a writer is, what a writer does, and it changed my work habits, and it changed uh, everything. And I did it his way, and I took all of that, all, all, and he was absolutely right, all of that discipline that I put into other people's work, I put in, I, I started putting into my work, our work. And, 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 and it was, it, it, and, and Beetlejuice came out of that. And as crazy and, you know, and as far out as that movie is, the script was written in a very disciplined way because that was the way Michael needed to work. Um, the process is super complex um, and it's evolved over a long period of time of how to write stuff. I definitely agree with Ty that um, a big part of screenwriting is, is uh, forcing yourself to just to just create and to not an analyze and to not put it into an intellectual space. I mean, my brother even talks into a dictaphone, you know. Um, but, you know, honestly, I think the, the best piece of advice and the toughest part about writing something, in my opinion, is the first draft. And I call it the vomit draft, where you just literally puke up. In my opinion, the best thing you can do for yourself is just to write a terrible first draft. That's got to be your mindset. It's like, what I'm about to write is going to be horrible, but it's going to allow me to have a platform to redo scenes, to build it up, to give it to my friends, let them read it, tell me how to make it better. You know, it just, you have to create the foundation and it's all about getting it out of your head and onto a piece of paper because once it's on a piece of paper, now you have something that exists in the world that you can share with other people. It's a theme that I've been talking about a lot, is like really getting out of your head and, and making the process, getting into the world. I don't allow myself to go back when I'm writing something. I just force myself to go all in a row. I don't necessarily go away to do it, but when I do write, I try to get it out as fast as possible, and I, and I, and I don't look back. Um, it's so tempting to do it, but if you do that, you'll start rewriting, and you'll start reanalyzing where you're going. I think it's super important just to keep going and to finish it and then you can start thinking about it and analyzing it. People just get bored. I get bored of ideas all the time and, and you know there's a that's a that's a tricky point to realize like you know a lot of people have a lot of ideas spinning in their head and, and I think you know I've only recently come to really value my own time and like what I'm going to spend time on. It's such a critical decision which idea you're going to execute. Um, and I think it's also important not to let ideas sit too long. You know, if they sit too long, you're probably gonna get bored and you're probably gonna have churned it enough to where you don't need to explore it in screenplay form or in, or in filmmaking form, you know? There are several different ways you can start a screenplay. Um, and a lot of that goes back to whatever your idea is, is probably the thing that's gonna come to you first. But you should definitely then start trying to figure out what all the rest of those elements are. So figuring out what the world is, knowing what the tone is. A lot of people may not think about tone, but tone matters. Uh, tone is that, um, that, that, um, that, that feeling that makes this different from slapstick comedy, regular comedy, romantic comedy, into kind of a comedic drama that is now 
more regular drama, family drama that ends up now this gritty thriller thing. So it, it's kind of like the, the nuance <laughs> between the genres, right? Like what that tone is. Um, and then knowing who your characters are, knowing who's gonna go on this journey, figuring out why we should care about them, um, uh, figuring out how we're gonna relate to them and relating to them doesn't have to mean liking them, we just have to relate. Um, then knowing what goal they're after because anything that's on TV, anything that's on, uh, anything that's a feature is about a character reaching a goal. That's why we're here. We don't want to just see people go through their day-to-day -day lives, right? We want to see like they're after something or something's after them, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, but they have a goal. Um, figuring out what the stakes are. The stakes are going to be the why. Why am I here? Why do I care? What's, what's going on? What are they going to win? What are they going to lose? Um, because if not, then why do I care if they reach the goal? If they don't, if there's nothing at stake for them, then I am going to be that much less invested. Um, and people usually know what the end is. People usually kind of know what the setup is and they kind of know what the resolution is, right? It's the second act where everyone kind of falls apart. And it's because we really don't start asking, our, our, asking ourselves, how? How are they gonna get from A to B? So I personally feel like everyone should write an outline. There are gonna be writers who are reading this like, ha, huh, I've never written an outline and I've done great. That's great. You might have that special skill, <laughs> you know? You also might be a person who doesn't mind rewriting 15 times because no matter what, you're gonna rewrite, right? I think by writing the outline, you cut down the number of rewrites because your first draft isn't as terrible because you've actually plotted out what it is you're going to do. So you didn't just start at the blank page and start writing and just like, you know, oh, well maybe they'll go this way and maybe they go that way. Because as soon as you change one thing, what does it do? It changes everything else, there's a domino effect. If you're doing that in outline form, for some people that's putting it on cards, some people that's putting it on a whiteboard, you know, now you just erase that one little part and write it, write it back or you move your, your cards around because you realize this scene could probably be best there and it heightens the stakes if we make this thing happen here. I do mine in a Word document and I put um, the actual uh, scene heading on top and then whatever's happening in that scene so I can copy and paste that whole little thing all over the place if I want to. So it's easier to kind of see your story on paper and move it around as much as you'd like before it gets into script format. Then it becomes a little harder to do that. So if you have an outline and you really understand how does this person get from A to C? What happens during B? What do they physically do? So I'm always asking, how? And so people will then answer that with, with a general answer. And I'll go, no, no, no. I wanna know what the character's physically doing. Like, what am I watching them do? You can say, well, they're saving the world. <laughs> how? Are they saving the world by going to Starbucks? Are they saving the world by having to go confront a bad guy? Yes, they have to confront the bad guy. How? How do they find him? Where was he? Was he just down the street? Was he, you know, in another country? He's in another country. How do they get there? <laughs> you know, do they take a bus? Do they take a train? Do they have to fly? Do they swim? You know, like all of these little details about how we actually get from A to C are the things that people don't think about until they're on the page and then they're, then they're stuck and they stop. And they're like, I can't get past this part. And it's like, yeah, because you didn't think about that part until you got here. But if you took some time to figure it out before you get to the writing part, now the writing is fun because you got your notes and you're like, oh, okay, this is what's supposed to be happening right now. Oh, okay, I get it. And now it can happen a, a little more clean than it would have if you just went straight to the page. And so now maybe instead of doing five rewrites, you only have to do two. What I usually think of when I'm writing, most times I come up with a character but I know I have to figure out what is the character's issue. And then I stop and think, well, if he's got this issue, how is he going to deal with that issue? And that's when I start to write the seven points. Because I think that comes before writing almost anything else. I usually write the short, very short bios of the characters that I have in mind. Uh, only three or four sentences. The physiology, the psychology, the sociology of the character. But then uh, I figure out, well, what is the character doing now? What's the character's flaw? Because that's the, the most important driving point of the character. What is the character's flaw? What is he going to have to do to overcome that flaw? Why does he have to overcome that flaw to achieve his or her goal? So I figure out what is the character's ordinary life? And I just write that in one or two sentences. Then I figure out, well, what's going to make him change? What's going to happen from the outside that's going to make him change? And then I write that point. And then I figure out, well, what's he going to do about that? 
and that's the goal and the plan. And then I figure out, well, what's going to make him turn around at the midpoint to realize what's really going on, what he really needs to do. And so I write one or two sentences about that. And then I figure out, well, how does he screw up? And, um, and how does that bring him down and make it make a, a low point for him? And then I figure out how does he bring himself back up and face the final challenge? And I write a couple of sentences about that, what that final challenge might look like. And then I figure out, whoa, well, how's it going to be after that? What's his life going to be as a normal person again? Or is now changed forever normal life? And then the, the process follows after that. Then I generally write, if I haven't already written bios for everybody, I do a, usually a full page bio for each central character. That would be uh, the protagonist, the antagonist also deserves a bio and the central emotional relationship and anybody else that is important, maybe a catalyst of some sort. I write those bios, then I write a beat sheet and I stop and figure out to, with the seven points in mind, what are the beats that lead from each point to the next point? It varies with each project and sometimes I'll just get an idea and I'll start writing and I'll be like, oh, I'm writing. Where's this gonna go? Maybe it goes nowhere, but maybe it does go somewhere. And so every project that I write, it's, it's a different process in terms of getting it down on the page. There's no real process that I follow. And, and I think that that's what keeps it fresh in my mind. And that's what keeps me coming back to screenwriting. With my every story, every idea that I have, there's a new way to approach it. And whether it's uh, Thomas Lennon's way of approaching something, which I, I really connected to, or whether it's just writing down certain uh, ideas or visions or what the cinematography is going to be, then that's, that's a whole different way of looking at approaching a script. If you do a very specific long outline where you know exactly what the scenes are going to be and who the characters are in each scene, you can transfer that into final draft and then have just the scenes in there, but then you are writing the characters in the dialogue. So when you transfer it over to final draft, it's already like 15, 20 pages in. And so it's way easier to write and finish a script if you have an amazing outline and you know exactly where it's gonna go. And then you can even hop back and forth. So what's exciting to me is, like I said, I, I don't write unless I'm getting joy from the script. And so maybe I wanna write the ending first. So then I write the ending because I already know what scenes are necessary to get to the end. So then I just write that ending and then I work backwards. I always write a vomit first draft and it's actually terrible. And writing is all about rewriting. So for me, I'm just trying to get to the page count. And once I get to 90, I get really excited and that is cause for celebration. And then I go back and I look at my draft and it's terrible. And so I look through it and I do my own version of a second and third drafts of that. And then that's when I get to send it off to my four or five friends that I trust to give me critical, smart notes that will actually help move the script along. And then I gather those notes and I read through them and, and I see if any of the notes are actually similar. And I tackle those notes first. And then at this point, I'm at the fourth, fifth draft of the script. And it's getting there, but it's not perfect. And then I, I tend to finish a script when it's on its sixth or seventh draft. I think how someone talks is part of who they are. Um, so for me, coming from theater, that was always how I found the story and found characters. And I would start with dialogue and just put two characters in a room and and have them talk and figure out who they are and what's their dynamic and what are they interested in and what do they do all day and um so i think it really dialogue really helps me find the story and then you know of course you have to go in and structure it and and trim it and 
and do that all in the rewrite. But, but I like the characters to tell me what the story is. So my process is probably a little different than most people. I, I write 15 pages a day. Wow. So um, basically I figure out when it's due and I back out 15 pages per day and I take into consideration if I've got something going on in the afternoon. Like today is not a 15 page day because I'm, I'm with you guys. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I, and then I work until those 15 pages are done. So if I'm done at three o'clock because I had a great writing day and it went really smoothly, fantastic. If it takes me till nine o'clock, it takes me till nine o'clock and then that's when I end my day. It helps to, it helps me to do that because it, I keep on track and I also don't get caught up in my own, oh my gosh, I'm loving this, I just wanna keep going because that can happen too. When you're really on a roll writing, you'll, I mean, I've had that happen where you just don't eat and you just keep working through the night and you're just so excited about what you're writing. That's fine, um, but you can't make a living living that way, right? You have, I have relationships and I have people and dinner to make and things like that and so I stop when I, this is my way of doing it, I stop at 15 pages and that's it, and pick back up tomorrow and start again. I know that seems very technical, right, for something that's so creative, um, but again, like I said before, you have to look at this like a business, right? So you have to plan and organize and figure out what's giving you the best results, and for me, this gave me the best results um, because I know at page 11, I only have a few more pages to do and I can be done, um, and so, you know, and at the beginning of every day, I start out and I go, okay, that's enough, it's a big enough chunk that I'm not forcing myself to go back and reread. That's a deadly thing that writers do is they go back and they rewrite themselves over and over. So it forces you to keep moving through and then you do your rewrite at the end. And I build in usually a couple days off because you need that time away from it um, to kind of forget about it a little bit. And then when I come back and I reread it, I give myself two or three days to do the rewrite and it's just basically cleaning everything up or changing act breaks or you know, if I've come up with an idea in between that time to add, then I'll do that. And I think also you can get obsessed with, is the writing good? Is it not good? Do I like this? Do I not like it? When you have to get those 15 pages done, eventually you have to say, screw it, I've got to move on. And it forces you to move on, which I think is good for the process because nothing really good comes from sitting there obsessing over the same scene. So it is what it is. I moved on, I can come back to it. And giving yourself permission to do that, I think is very healthy. And I think it's actually good for the process and the product. First, it's, it's like excitement about the potential for something, even if I don't know what the ending is or the beginning is, just like, oh, that's an interesting, usually world, that's a, like an interesting world or in how, and characters within that world and, and like a conflict there. And, and I'll usually know if it sparks something and I think, okay, there's something there. There's there's a lot of opportunity there. Not not just one kind of story or one scene, but opportunity all the time in this in the concept to have conflict or humor or whatever it is. And really then what I like to do is just write whatever scene seems fun to me at you know starting out. It's really hard to start out on something new. Uh, you know there's a long road ahead and so just try and start with something fun like what scene excites me um, like early in my writing career after school I had a feeling I'm not a writer that was just the feeling I had maybe I could co-write but I didn't I had lost the confidence that I was a writer like a writer you know and getting back that's how I got back into it was just there was one scene I didn't know what the rest of the movie would be but I just really wanted to write this scene and I think that's a great way to to approach it and it lets you explore the characters for me I want to see how do they talk how do they talk to each other you know just kind of like let it let it happen and you'll start to think okay this character is fun I thought this character only existed in this one scene they made this character should exist in the whole movie because they bring something different that keeps it keeps it going and just being open and exploring and um, generally then I'll have I might have 50 pages 60 pages you know after a few weeks of that uh, they're not all usable, but there's a sense of what the story is and what's exciting there. And then it's figuring out, well, what, if I don't already know exactly where it's going to go in the end, it's figuring that out, you know, from there. After that part of the process, after writing scenes and, and figuring that out, then I will look at outlining and trying to think, how do I, um, how do we make it into one, you know, one cohesive story? and what are the underlying themes, what are the underlying conflicts. 
I do like, I saw you interviewed him, uh, John Truby. Like, I really love his, his book. He's awesome. And I think what I love about it is it's, even though he does sort of have these are the mile markers, I, I don't really focus on that part. It's more the sense of, you know, what's, what are the underlying themes? What's the moral argument? What's the, you know, how do you try and get the most out of your premise? So it's really asking a lot of questions, writing in notebooks. Okay, so really what is the premise of this? Like not just a log line, but what are, what's the, what's like, the conflict, you know, like why is it this character in this at this time doing this thing, and just trying to to really zero in at that point, what is um, what are the kind of mechanics happening under the surface of the script that gives it the drama or humor and all of that, and and trying to dial in on that as much as possible, and it feels like spinning wheels, but writing that stuff out over and over again, like what really is the moral argument here? What really is the, you know, the promise of the premise and how do we make sure that we're delivering on that? And if we're not, if we're missing something like do another pass and try and weave in the thing that we feel like we're missing. And just kind of doing that over and over again of finding layers and nuance and hopefully connections where things plant and pay off and, and feel like they're all working together uh, as one singular thing, like one singular story, as opposed to like an A story and a B story, like you'd have in a TV show, which might not necessarily thematically connect because it doesn't have to, you know, on a TV show. Um, but I think in a movie, it's trying to really make everything about the one idea as much as you can. You have your argument or your case, even though for me, I don't look at film or art as being like didactic and, and generally don't want to do that. I still think there's something you're trying to say. And, and as you're working, you have a sense of, well, this thing isn't what I'm trying to, isn't what we're trying to say. You know, this part, this scene, whatever, it, it just isn't part of it. It isn't part of that whole for whatever reason and trying to drill into that. Um, I guess the same way, yeah, if you were trying to literally argue in a courtroom or something, you know, your opposition might call out relevancy, you know, like, like, is it relevant to the, to what you're trying to, you know, the point you're trying to make or the emotion you're trying to get across. And so, yeah, I think it, it's that weird balance of being very, trying to be open and creative and, and write from the heart and, and not restrict yourself and be truthful. And then to put on a different hat and go back and, say, okay, look at it with under magnifying glass and say, what, what really is happening here or should be happening here? And how do we mold that into what it's supposed to be? And honestly, by the end of the process, I don't even feel like I've, I wrote it because I, it, it just seems like all of these different sides of, of me, I guess, taking a different pass on it. And, uh, and hopefully then you feel good about it. Everything that I write that's original comes out of some uh, inner obsession. So something I am um, freaked out about or obsessed with or uh, afraid of or that I can't stop thinking about. There's always some core kernel of interest that comes out of that space. So even you know, one of the examples that I often use, and I haven't written anything about this, is for whatever reason, like I'm not a coffee drinker. But I know a ton of, you know, ev almost everybody is a coffee drinker. So if I go, if I go there, if I start with that kind of, the question underneath that for me would be, why are people so interested in this thing that I'm not interested in? What does that mean about me? What does that mean about them? You know, and I can mine that into perhaps a story about how valuable coffee is. You know, perhaps it's contraband in a world where coffee is, you know, is rare. Uh, perhaps there's somebody who doesn't like coffee who's hoarding this substance, that, right? So suddenly I begin to brainstorm something from this obsession that starts to manifest into a big question and then a character, you know? And then who is that character? And then who is that character up against? You know, who is the person who's trying to get the coffee from this person? And suddenly, you know, my brain is populating with all these ideas. Uh, and then I will uh, solidify the character solidify that uh, antagonist, 
um, make clear decisions around what they're trying to do, and maybe there are other things they're up against. Maybe it's illegal to hoard the coffee and the police are involved. I don't know. But then I will create a, a log line from that uh, and begin to sort of sketch out the beginning, middle, and end, and then start using index cards to think of brainstorm moments. And then I'm off to the races. Then I'm sort of into the space of outline from that kernel of an idea. I think for me, the beat sheet comes um, after I've done my, uh, I'll do my brainstorming on index cards. So I will, um, I'll have a log line. The log line always suggests, uh, you know, what my beginning, middle, and end are going to be. I'm a big fan of, of Sid Field's um, description of, uh, of dramatic structure. And he talks about how, you know, there are these, in every story, there are two plot points. You know, he calls them plot points. And one is the moment that takes us from the beginning to the middle, sends us into the conflict. It's an event that, he, as he says, spins the story in a new direction. So, and then on the other side, on the other side of the conflict, there's a, what he calls plot point two that spins the story into a new direction, but this time toward a resolution. So the first thing that I do when I'm coming up with a story is, I will put those events, those two plot points, on two index cards. You know, one index card for plot point one, one index card for plot point two, uh, which, you know, that's the beginning and ending of my conflict. And then I'll just say to myself, well, what else needs to happen? What needs to happen before that moment? What needs to happen in between in the heart of the conflict? What needs to happen toward the end? And I just start writing on index cards and almost stream of consciousness. Well, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And I'll just keep making cards, as many as I can, until I run out of ideas. And I'll put them in order. And then once I have them, I'll go through and I'll separate out, oh, I don't think I need that, or these two are the same, or, right? And then once I have those, then I'll start to, if I'm satisfied with the order and what is a you know, loose structure at that point, I'll put those moments on, uh, on a in a document one after the other, and that's my beat sheet. This will happen first, this is this will happen second, this will happen third, and then I'm creating a, basically a list of actions that are gonna take me and the character through the entire journey of the script. It does depend on the story that you wanna tell, and it does depend on the individual. So one of the things I believe is applying cookie cutter sort of uh, techniques to any story or any writer or individual never really works. So a lot of books will tell you about like, oh, you've got to um, you know, do an outline first and the outline needs to look like this. This needs to be the first act, second act, third act, cookie cutter, damn, make your thing and that's it, right? Um, but I think every story has its own individual genesis within you as a writer you as a writer are, are an individual. And so when it appears and how it appears is very specific to the person. So some stories, the first step might be, I'm just gonna write some scenes because I'm, I'm seeing these scenes in my head. I'm gonna write some scenes out. You end up with a big mess. They call it, they're gardening. They're not architectures, you know. It's not architecture, it's gardening. But some scripts are like, oh, I've got this great plot of the story. And then you do the plot first, and then you write the scenes. So I do think it depends on the, sub, on the, on the um, person writing, what the story is, how it comes to you, and how you create it. However, I would say that at some point, if you're writing a feature film, actually, even if you're writing a TV series, probably more important if you are writing a TV series, Scene cards on the walls at some point to plan your story is very important. And that is vital because if you're just gardening and writing scenes for the sake of writing scenes, you're gonna just make a big messy garden. At some point you need to go in there with the you know weed trimmer and just make sure that there's actually a story there because it's grown into this thing and you don't even know what it is anymore. So I'd say the first step for writing a screenplay probably is being honest about yourself, the story you want to tell, and truthful in the way that you tell it. And so that might be doing a scene outline first, or it might be writing scenes first. But be honest with it and know that both have their own sort of limitations. But it's to know yourself as a writer, actually, I think is, is important.
So for many years I wrote sitcom back in South Africa. I don't know how many episodes I wrote and that was me being a writer for hire and that was literally like there's no time for gardening. It's just structure and I had a, co I had a writing partner. We would meet, we would beat out it, we would do a scene outline, you know, beat by beat what happens in each scene. We would send it to the production company. They would write back with some of their feedback. We'd do a second scene outline. Then we'd send that back. Then we'd flesh out the scenes. There'd be a feedback on those scenes and then you'd have a script. So I think when you're a writer for hire, it is very different. So you, you can't be true to your own creative idea when you're a writer. You can try, but you probably won't get very far. Um, I do think that that's when the structure works. And for me, scene, scene outlines are really good at that point. As a matter of fact, one of the things I found with my students is that a lot of people resist them because they feel unnatural as a creative person. You know, you don't really want to think of everything. I don't know how it's going to end. I'm starting the story. I'm exploring this world. But if you force yourself to do a scene outline, it helps so much because once you've got a scene outline, you can share it with other people and they can give you feedback on it, which is very important. And so you can actually see whether the story works. So I'm contradicting myself a little bit. I'm saying like, yeah, let's be creative writers, but scene outlines, I'm all for them. I think it really helps to just beat through the story. A feature film is a massive beast. We think we can hold it in our heads. We really can't. We have to get it onto the page. So my first sort of gut response when you said, how do you start writing a screenplay? I'm like, put words on a page. Very important. And then put words in a page in a particular order and then put those words in an order that makes sense for a feature film. And then that's how you write a feature film. Well, it depends on which script. It depends on where the story is coming from. But generally speaking, uh, I don't have a backstory um, beyond a sentence or two. Okay, you know, I don't know what they, you know, what they were like in sixth grade or anything like that. I just kind of take from people in real life, or combine people in real life, or think of people I know. When I again, I just bounce these characters off each other knowing that this one is, you know, sort of uh, feisty and this one is sort of mellow and this one is sort of this and then you can add on the second and the third adjective sort of as you, as you go. But I think in the, in the beginning, if I'm going to introduce a character that I've never written in my life, you know, I uh, say, you know, Joe, 25, um, persistent, you know, I don't know, I'll say two adjectives and then I'll just move forward. That's it. It's real, real quick. Um, and then I don't necessarily have to deliver on those adjectives if I feel like it's going in another direction. Maybe he's not persistent. <laughs> maybe he's maybe he's lackluster. Maybe he's lazy. I don't know. I have to like write him out a little bit. I have to let him talk in order to, to, to know. Um, but the dynamic between characters is important and the chemistry. So I always start there. That's where I start. And the story and the concept I have as like, you know, a sentence. It's, just one, it's not an outline. It's not an, it, that's not detailed or in depth. The first draft will be detailed um, to the absolute, ex to the extent it needs to be in order to be concise to the point and not dragging anywhere where we don't need to be, in, in particularly in the action. So uh, we enter this room, am I going to tell you that it's got blue walls and a couch? No. Because the characters are what are important and the room is for the director. That's not my job, I'm the screenwriter. The room is for the director to decide and if you're the director and the screenwriter, great, or whatever. But you know, people respond to characters first and foremost. And so that's just really the most detailed part of my screenplays. The action, I would say, is the briefest part of my scripts. I have a weird process. I read this book uh, called The Mind of the Maker by Dorothy L. Sayers. And it's a fascinating book. I recommend it anybody in the creative field. Um, she wrote in the 19, uh, 1941, it came out. Um, and she was a mystery writer, but she wrote this one. It was about, she was trying to write a book of theology, but in trying to explain the mind of, of a god, she uses artists and writers as an example. And it's a, one of the things I loved about it is she said that as a creator, you create the world, you create the physics of it and the laws of it, and you create the people that inhabit it, but then you give them free will. <laughs> And to me, that is the most organic form of writing. And so 
my writing process is I try to I try to just see the world and try to understand it and know who my characters are and the premise. And then I literally just I ferment on that for a while until I feel like I have an understanding. I'll write notes and stuff like that. And then I literally just sit down and write. And just when it comes to a plot point, like what would they do here? What would they do here? And letting the character I've conjured in my mind have that free will to make those choices instead of me guiding them. And the only time I fin feel like I hit a writer's block now is when I'm trying to force them to do something they wouldn't do. <laughs> um, and so that is kind of my writing process. And then once I have a first draft out, that's when I then go back and start asking myself those questions like, okay, here's some of the themes I wanted to address that maybe aren't as clear, aren't in it. How do I put that into it? How do I, is there a where, place where this works? Is there a place where this works? Um, and so I have a kind of a weird writing style I developed after reading that book. And it was, to me, it was a lifesaver because that's why Frey ended up being the film it is, was I, after reading that, I changed my whole creative style and writing style based on what I'd read in there. And uh, um, it obviously worked with Frey. <laughs> uh, so I decided to keep doing it that way. And, um, you know, I think that's part of why Blood from Stone is so different as well, is I don't set up a structure, I don't set up markers, I don't have any plot points I write down. It's like, here's the world, here's the characters, let's see where we go. The first four weeks are all about imagining the world of your story. We do a lot of stream of consciousness writing exercises. In fact, the first week you don't even investigate structure. Um, because I really believe that the subconscious is the seat of your genius. So what you do is you just imagine your characters in relationship to other characters. Because the moment you start to explore plot, or the moment you want to start to put a frame around this story, um, we can get stuck. And so it's a process of going from the general to the specific. So imagining the world of the story, it's really just about asking questions and, and holding them loosely. Like, who is this character? How old are they? Where do they live? Who are they in relationship to? And quickly writing it down. Uh, I'll, I'll do a, a longhand, uh, you know, on a yellow legal pad. And, and as you start to allow the characters to exist in this world, um, it starts to lead to the structure questions, which happens really in, in the second week of the workshop. And, um, and that, 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 that's what I mean by marrying the wildness of your imagination, which is just imagining the world without imposing structure, to, to the rigor of story structure, which is, is, is the experiential questions. And um, what happens, this is sort of non-linear narrative starts to emerge. And it's sort of like a Polaroid coming into focus. It's not, it's not chronological. It's not, it's, not, it's not like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's, 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 it's more akin to this Polaroid where um, you can jump around and you can say, well, what, what might be the dark night? What, what is that decision your protagonist makes that they can't go back on? And, and what is that... Um, what is that dark night of the soul? What is that moment of despair? Um, what is that moment of temptation? And, and these experiences start to emerge. Or you do the transformation exercise. How is my protagonist relating differently to other characters at the end than they were at the beginning? And what do they understand at the end that they didn't understand at the beginning? And as you do that exercise repeatedly, what happens is it creates a gold mine of images for what precedes your ending. So, so let's say I, my, my protagonist is, she's hugging her mother at the end of the story. Well, I need, to, uh, I need to show where she's not getting along with her mother, so there's a context for the hug at the end, for example. So um, you're really just playing in the sandbox with these, these tools, and, uh, and, and, and the story starts to emerge. Once you've done that for four weeks, that's when you write your first draft. Because the, if you were to come up with a premise and start writing your first draft on day one, you're writing your idea of your screenplay. You're not writing the truth of the screenplay. In fact, I just read an interview with uh, Scott Frank, brilliant screenwriter, um, and he said he, uh, he spends the first couple of months just sort of wandering around, wondering about the story, and, uh, and, 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 and being curious about what is that opening scene? How can I best introduce this character? Um, and so the more you give yourself time to imagine 
the characters in relationship to each other, the more you're going to fill the well with images. So when you start writing your first draft, you're going to have a really dynamic narrative. Then we do uh, the next four weeks. You write the you write the first draft in in sort of a modular fashion. So the, you spend a week uh, writing your first act. You spend two weeks writing the second act because it's typically approximately twice the length of the first act. And then the fourth week is writing your third act. And you want to get it down quickly. You fill the well with images. You, an outline has emerged. You've got a sense of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now let's get this thing down as fast as you can without rushing. And so a week is plenty of time to write 30 pages. There's not a lot of ink on the page in a, in a screenplay. You know, there's a lot of, so it's, it's um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to go back and rewrite your first draft. Just, just, just start to get it all down. And then, and then in the final uh, five weeks of the workshop is when we, uh, when we do the, the rewrite or the polish. How should a writer outline their story? Well, I think there's as many ways to outline it as there are writers. Um, there's, uh, there are no rules in creating a story. We're making art. And so uh, I think an outline is valuable, but every writer has a different sort of uh, relationship to how specific they want their outline to be. Some writers want a really, a really vague sort of loose outline. Others, other writers require uh, an extremely um, uh, considered and concise outline before they can, before they can begin. And so um, it's only through the, the, the process of creating a story that you're going you're gonna to sort of find uh, what feels right for you. And it's probably going to vary from one project to the next. The moment we approach art like it's long division, we're going to get stuck. We're going to get into our heads. So it's really... Um, I think sometimes there's, there comes a point, it's almost like you reach this, it's like a super saturation point where you can't contain the story any longer and it's just demanding to be written. And I think that's, what, that's when you start to write it. But sometimes what happens is, is I, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but, but, but sometimes writers want to sort of prematurely jump into the first draft. And uh, there's, this, there, there's this real eagerness just to get started. And I'll say, if you really want to start writing your first draft, there aren't any rules. Go ahead and get started. But what if you just took a breath and just spent a few more days uh, 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 exploring the world of your story and uh, allowing this outline to emerge? And often what happens is if they do that, they'll have a breakthrough. And they'll go, oh my God, I'm, I'm glad I didn't start writing yet because I'm now understanding the story and sometimes in some fundamental way that had I begun writing the story, um, I would have probably had more work to do in, in the rewrite process. So, you know, we're, we're, we're always looking for the path of least resistance. And I think that um, if you really give yourself some uh, solid time to explore the world of your story, uh, it's going to save you time in the long run because if you if you have a solid outline, you're going to. Uh... The other thing about the outline is when you have a solid outline, you're far more inclined to have the confidence to stray from it. But if you don't have an outline, it can it can ironically you can start to get neurotic and controlling because oh, I got to get this thing to work. But if you got the outline. You, you, you're, you're, I always tell my writers, if you know you're going to go left in a scene, you must go right. Meaning, if you know, I'll give you an example. So here's a, Billy says to Sally, will you marry me? And Sally says, yes, Billy, I'll marry you. Well, I just told you exactly what happened in the scene. It doesn't mean anything. If you saw that scene, you would go, what is happening? But if Billy says, Sally, will you marry me? And Sally says, yes, Billy but only if you work for my father, the hitman. Now we know what the scene's about. Bill, now Billy has a dilemma. He's in love with Sally, but, but, but he's required to <laughs> be a hitman in order to uh, have his heart's desire. Okay, so um, until we understand what the, uh, the protagonist's dilemma is, meaning can't get conveyed. Most screenwriting books uh, and teachers are teaching you backwards. They're teaching you to 
analyze all these successful films. They all have these things in common. Now, if you go back and plug in, you do the exact same formula, and just plug in your characters, you'll have a success too, and it absolutely does not work that way. Because of what I, because of, um, because the film is, uh, its purpose is to make the audience feel something, it's important that you start with your right brain, I'm being very simplistic now psychologically, but the right brain is roughly responsible for the emotional intelligence of, of, our, of our personalities. The left brain is the rational part. They're telling you to start with the left brain, which is say, analyze it, then write it, and maybe you'll feel it in there somewhere. That's incorrect, in my opinion. That you need to start with, by feeling it, feeling the passion of it, try to get that onto the page, and then after you have, then go back and analyze it. And of course, that last step of analyzing it is critical to make sure that the audience is gonna get what you intended. It isn't just first blurt. You're not just putting something on the page. You then, you then analyze it uh, and reanalyze it and re-reanalyze it to make sure it's doing what you wanna do. But first, you have to feel it. Um, it's, uh, it's what I call organic screenwriting as opposed to uh, the more formulaic screenwriting. What are you passionate about? What did you, why did you write this story to begin with? What are you excited about? And then uh, get that on the page, get that, at least the process started, and then go back and analyze and see, is there a better way we could do it? Should that be moved from here to there? And all the other uh, decisions that go into properly structuring a screenplay. But if you don't feel it first, you're pretty much doomed. I think if you want to write a screenplay, you should take the path of least resistance. So start the screenplay however feels easiest and most fun to you, right? Um, if you don't know where to start, I think a good place to start is with just a brain dump. So I think sitting down with whether it's you know notebook and pen or on your laptop or whatever, and just writing down everything you know about the story. And it doesn't even have to be stuff that you know that happens in the story. It can be things that you like about this type of movie. So I love horror movies because they scare the pants off of me and they make me grab my boyfriend's arm or whatever it is. You can write all of that stuff down. That's all part of like what you're going to try to get into your project, right? So everything that inspires you about it, maybe why you wanna write it, maybe um, the last movie you saw that felt sort of like you would like your movie to feel, uh, movies that inspire you. And then also in that same document, I would also try to put everything that you do know about the story. So. Uh, the idea that I have is about this guy and this is his backstory and these are his friends and this is the situation he finds himself in and I don't know where this goes but he encounters some sort of swamp monster and you know stream of conscious consciousness just brain dump I think that's the great place to start your story for two reasons one because it gets you um, to kind of like download your spark of inspiration right which is really useful later on when you're feeling bored and tired of your story you can revisit that document and remember like what was it like when i fell in love with this story um, and then the second reason is that you can actually pull a lot of the sort of elements that you need to start building your story from that document so if you said i know it's about this guy who you know grew up in texas that's probably your protagonist, right? So that gives you one of your elements. And you can sort of start circling the things that you've written down that you may not have known were important yet, but you can start using those elements to build your story from. So that's where I, that's where I think everyone should start. If they don't know where to start, um, start with a brain dump. First thing that you have to do is figure out the story that you wanna tell. So it's really about a concept that you come up with. Um, based on that concept, you start to think about um, the overall story, the act breakdowns, uh, when things are going to happen, where they need to happen. So uh, a crucial element for me specifically is uh, storyboarding and getting your boards done. So um, breaking down each act, breaking down each scene, um, making sure that there is you know conflict in each scene that you have, making sure that there are emotional shifts between your characters. Um, making sure that they're getting from point A to point B uh, in the time that you need them to get there and making sure that they have arcs and that there's growth. So I think that's a major part of it. On top of that is, is developing your characters within that story. So I think you start with your protagonist, you start with your antagonist, you start to pepper in you know, the potential love story or the B stories or the C stories 
And I just always make sure, this is part of the reason why I spend so much time on character development, whether that's you know two, three, four months, is because I wanna make sure that every single character has a story to tell and starts one way and ends another way. Um, so I'm, I'm very apparent about getting an arc out of all my characters. So um, with those storyboards, you can really see who is where, what they're doing, and dissect why they're doing it. So it's an incredible, incredibly important part of the process. Of, of telling a story because you know I as I mentioned before I know some people that just sit down and start writing and I don't know that that's the best approach it might work for some people but I don't think it works for a lot of other people for most writers because you really have to know the exact story it has to be bulletproof before you start sitting down and writing that dialogue out or writing the scenes out or writing you know um, the script so um, the development process of the story is crucial and I would just recommend um, if you don't know how to do it on your own read the books that it takes to, to know how to do that if you do know how to do it stay vigilant and dedicated to that process um, and you know I, I think there's some enjoyment out of boards sometimes because you get to see that story start coming to fruition in front of you and you're not too far in and too deeply attached yet you're still creating this world the way that you want to create it what are the basic elements that i need and so i kind of just focus on five main things um knowing that in th there are things in between these five things that i need to have i need to have conflict obviously which helps to to change your protagonist over time and so i always start with the ending of so initially i come up with, with an idea okay there's an idea for something that I want to write. Great. What do I want to say? What's the theme? So I go there first. Um, if I can, I come up with a logline, and I kind of use that as my North Star. That way I remember, okay, it's always about this moment. That may change over time. Then I go ahead and I do the ending. How do I want this character to end? By the ending of, of this TV show, uh, pilot, or movie, what do I want to have them end? And then I start them in the exact opposite in the very beginning. So I have two pieces that I need. I know I need an exciting incident. What sets them off on their journey? You know, um, they get this letter that came out of the blue. Um, they open the door and there's a dead body. You know, something that happens, that's the inciting incident. So that's, that's there. And then I need a midpoint. So kind of twist that happens in the middle. And then I need an all is lost moment. So I have those five points. And then from there, I go ahead and I, I start making beats. So I, knowing that I need to get to these five points, then I begin to create a beat sheet. And the beat sheet is literally just, okay, then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then meet this person, and then this happens. And it's blah, it's everything. There's nothing that's off limits. And a lot of it doesn't get used, but some of it does. And then once I have an idea of, through the beats, I begin to massage the beats to make sure that it makes sense that based upon these beats or these scenes, this character is changing and they're making decisions and there's conflict and who's, con you know, who's creating the conflict. And I start, I, I start coming up with characters that can help to drive this protagonist one way or the other um, to get to these five main, main points. And then after that's done, and then I create an outline and my outlines are very detailed. Um, what I typically do with my outline is I take my beats that have been approved that, that I'm going to go with um, and then I, I, I put them on a, um, on a uh, you know, in a, um, a Word document, something like that. And I put down location, exterior, interior, location, day, night. Underneath that, in, in parentheses, I put down the name of the characters that are in the scene. And then I put down, um, you know, a summary of what the scene is about. What does each character want? Sometimes I'm going to fill some dialogue. I'll throw in some dialogue in there. That will be temporary dialogue that I'll change later on. But just get an idea of what it is. And I do that for all the beats until I'm done with the whole thing. And when I'm done, then I copy this and I paste it into Final Draft. And now I have my outline. And the reason why, I know not everybody uses an outline, but there are going to be times when you are on a paid project, they're going to ask you for an outline. And so it's good to, it's a good habit to develop the habit of outlining because sometimes you'll have to, that's part of your deliverable to a network um, that you need to have an outline. So once that's done, now it's like, it's like 15 to 20 pages. And when I have that, I'm go. That's why it takes me such a short amount of time to, 
to write because at that point it's, it's just dialogue. At, at that point, I know what the characters want. I know who's in the character. You know, I, I know who, who's in the scene. I know the location. I know if it's day or night. I've done all the hard work. Now it's just about let's go have fun. Let's write. How how do we get there in the scene? How does you know? How does Steve? you know, get upset at, 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 at Harry. Is she hiding something from him? Are there any? And I just do a first vomit draft. Blah, get everything done. Um, for me, it takes about two weeks to, once everything's outlined, it takes about two weeks to finish a feature film. My first draft. Then I put it away for like a day. And I always, at the end of, whenever I finish writing my first draft, I always drink something, a little alcohol, um, and I will go eat something. Something like, you know, spend some money. And go just like celebratory, like, whew, the hard part's done. Then I'll go back after a day and I'll start looking at it. And I'll go back into each of these scenes and I'll make sure, like, is there, are there nuances in there? Am I, did, did I write too much? Is there too many words? Can we, because I'm a director, I also look at, you know, ways that I can visually look and tell the story without words. You know, I would much rather do that kind of stuff. Um, and I go back and I, and I do that for every single scene. And that takes me about a week to do. And then after that, I go ahead and give my script to my brother, who has, who has learned through your website, through me teaching him. He's learned, he, and he, he works in aerospace. We've actually written two scripts together over 2020. We did two feature films that we wrote together because he's gotten the hang of storytelling. Um, I give it to him, he gives me some notes back. Things that he, he, cause he's logical. So he gives me the, this doesn't make sense. How did he get here? Like, like, like character wise, like why is he so upset? What happened before to get him to this point? So I'll go back and I'll maybe add a few extra scenes or whatever to, to earn why we are at this point in the, in, in the character's behavior. Then I'll give it to a friend of mine that's a woman uh, and she, uh, she's an actress, but she also writes. And because I like to get a woman's point of view about certain things, especially because a lot of my characters are women. And I want to get somebody else's point of view that's, you know, not a male um, in reference to how this person is behaving. And she'll give me the real skinny. Like I told her, like, don't play with me. Like, give me the truth. And she'll tell me, like, we would never do this. Or this is what would happen. And so I, like, I can now go back and I can make that right. And then I'll give it to my management team. And they'll give me notes and they'll tear it apart. And then we'll get that cleaned up. And then after that, that's when I can, you know, take it out and go and go shopping with it. So that's my process in a nutshell. My process changed um, a bit as I was going. There was definitely a phase um, in my mid twenties where I brought out the cork board and started doing like the cue cards, you know, on the board, like, all right, here's act one, here are the scenes in it, here's act two, et cetera. Um, and I sort of fell away from that because what I found and this is the process that I found on Broken Ceiling that really worked for me, was just going into a Word doc and making a very descriptive outline. I think the outline for the film was about 20 pages. Oh wow. Um, and I would, I would write like one through 10, what's happening there, 11 through 20, and just break it sort of down, you know, because I needed to make sure that the audience was kept on their toes throughout the entire thing. So I needed to know, okay, like what's going on in this 10 minute sequence? What's going on in the next 20 minutes? How do I make that different from that? How do I make these twists? Like, where does this come into the thing? Like making it so that it's the most dramatic and enjoyable thing that it can be. Um, but I found, and that's what I've used ever since, is like just making, almost pre-writing the movie which is interesting. I'll just, you know, free type and, and write everything. Sometimes there's dialogue included, sometimes there's not, sometimes it's just descriptions. But if dialogue comes out, write that down. It's a good starting point. But I just go through and, you know, they, they range from 10 to 20 to sometimes 30 pages based on the project or how long it is. But I really like writing out the movie in full so I can have that Word doc open as I'm writing the script and sort of like, compare and go, okay, this is working, this is working, or changing things if, if I find that something doesn't work all of a sudden. The first step before the first step is have a brilliant idea. Then, now that's the art part, then you start doing the craft. And what, what I always do when I'm working with writers is to identify the mythic theme. What is the story they're telling? 
And once you identify that theme, then you can look at the plot points that go along with that theme, usually, oh, 12 to 20. If you hit six of those plot points, whether it's the fatal attraction theme, the stealing fire from heaven theme, the search for the promised land theme, they all have plot points and you need to hit some of them so that we, your audience, will go, even unconsciously or subconsciously, will go, oh, it's that story. Yeah, I like that one. Okay, let's, let's see how this person tells that story. And here again, it may just be a, a subconscious thing, but these are the stories that are in our collective unconscious and that we've been telling each other for thousands and thousands of years. So identify your theme. Um, look into the myth and on your own or working with someone who does that or working with a, a book that outlines it. Then uh, pick six plot points that you can use in your story and don't feel like you have to go in order. You can mix things around, but you need to give us that resonance. You need to strike those notes so that we recognize the key that you're playing in. So identify your theme, pick out six at least plot points, and then archipaths. Just use those five of the warrior, the monk, the scientist, the magician, and the lover. Makes it so much easier than trying to go through the other many, many archetypes. So identify your main three characters. What is their path? And then, do you want them to stay there? Do you want them to grow into the next level? Or are they going to be taken down to a lower level? And then try to struggle their way back up. Or maybe they're switching from one path to another. That's a lot of dramatic conflict there. Maybe you've got someone on the warrior path who wants to give that up and go be a poet, get on the lover path. And so what are the, the conflicts there that arise from them shifting their arc path. I'll come up with an idea, right? Or I'll come up with a character, or I'll come up with a theory. Um, and most of the time for me, it's like, it's a thesis, it's something, and I think that might be because I, I, I read, I, I love to read so much literature and I, and I kind of come from philosophy that I, I develop a thesis or something that I want to say. Um, and then I find characters that I think I that can embody that purpose and that that can function in a story. It kind of carries this idea throughout it. Um, so I can communicate what I want to say in a story and through characters. So always comes starts with an idea or a thesis or a theory that I want to talk about. And the characters in the story kind of all fall in line from there. Um, then I'll just, you know, kind of binge watch a bunch of movies that apply and I'll just write, you know, I carry a little notebook around me everywhere I go. So, cause I don't really type that much. I, I mean, I type, but I, I don't really write my script until I've written it, handwritten it a bunch of times in a bunch of different ways. And I've kind of flushed out my characters and that only then do I write the plot. Um, because I think that at least in, right now in the stories that I'm trying to tell, it's the characters motivate the plot rather than the plot motivating the characters. So I want to really know my characters like they're friends of mine, like they're my best friends, my childhood friends. And so once I know them, I kind of know the world. Once I know the world, I know the story. So that's my process. As I mentioned, I have ideas rattling in my head. When I decide that I want to work on something, the first thing that I do is I get a composition notebook, uh, usually like one of those black and white speckled notebooks. Uh, and that's a holdover from junior high. Uh, my writing teacher, that's what she made us, you know, we had to get the black and white speckled notebook. That's where all of our assignments, you know, we did them in that notebook. So that's just stuck with me to this day. Um, I get a notebook, write the working title on the cover, and on the first page, first page is reserved for the title and character names. Uh, I usually start with the protagonist, right? Once I've got that notebook, 
every idea, every thought that I have about this story goes into that notebook. There's no real rhyme or reason. I don't, you know, aside from the first page, I don't have, say, like a section for dialogue or anything like that. You know, I just, everything that I've been thinking goes into that notebook. If I go out to have lunch or whatever and something hits me that I think would be perfect, I come back and I put it in that notebook. Um, once I have kind of like all the notes and everything, uh, I craft my outline. My outlines are not too detailed. You know, they're pretty spare. And this is because once I have the outline, I start writing. The story really, really like develops. It really begins to tell itself. You know, I've got my notes. I've got the outline. I know what's supposed to happen. But it blossoms during the writing process. So I like to, you know, keep things loose. The outline is like, you know, very spare. And I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, I write, I can't write out of order. I'm not one of those writers. I know a lot of people that say, oh, if a scene is hard for you, you know, just write TK, TK and come back to it. I can't do that. I have to work it out in that moment. And if I'm not able to work it out in that moment, then that's where I stop for the day. And when I come back to it the next day or whatever, Let's give it another go. And um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much my process. And I mean, that's that's for my my books as well. You know, um, all of my books, same thing. Get the notebook, write the characters, throw in whatever notes, outline it, and then write. By the time I start writing the actual script, I know the story so well. I don't have to review the previous day's pages or you know start from scratch. I don't have to do any of that. I just jump in at the at the scene and I keep going. Um, and then once the script is finished, then you know of course I go back and I read from the beginning and see. Um, and usually things things work out. I mean there may be some things that I'd have to shift or you know whatever. Maybe there's a, a payoff that you know, didn't have a setup and so I may need to include that or whatever. But for the most part, you know, because I know the story so well, I can just jump right in and... Funny enough, I think it begins with a lot of chaotic notes on my phone. <laughs> it's, I, I'll start with some sort of vague idea and it's usually because I've seen something that like, oh, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting if it's in a, in a movie or a book or, you know, old mythology, it could be kind of anything, and I start on a concept and then I kind of see what's being done, and a lot of times what I think it's going to be, it ends up going in a different direction, and they didn't take it the way I wanted it, or they didn't do what I thought they were going to do with it, and I was like, oh, why not? Someone should do that. And so I'll, you know, write something down briefly on my phone, I'll be like, oh, you know, something about, you know, like an alien, or like <laughs> whatever it'll be, I'll have some sort of vague concept, and I'll be like, oh, or you know this interesting idea for a superpower or whatever, and it will be the first note, and I will just make it real brief, and then something else will come to me about that same idea, and I go back to that note, and I kind of just like type something in, like oh you could add this too, and that would be interesting, and by the time I finish whatever my current project is, I usually have at least one note that is just really long, and I'm like oh here's a there's a story here, like I've got a ton of bits and pieces and then I go through from there and I try to actually kind of organize the notes. And so sometimes it's things like chronological order but there will also be like character notes in there and I'll be like, okay, so the character, this is all the stuff about this character, this is all the stuff about this character and then here's kind of a chronological order of the events that I was thinking of and it's, it's been a really easy outlining process for me because I used to kind of do more of a, a intentionally structured approach where I would kind of make an outline and then each step I would go, what happens next? What happens next? What happens next? And it didn't flow as well. There wasn't as much of a kind of natural rhythm to it as when I took all these chaotic pieces and I just organized them. <laughs> I just put them in order. And then usually you'll see where the gaps are 
it's like, oh, well, how do we get from, you know, this thing happening to this thing happening? Okay. And then a lot of times I'll just write in something happens to make them go here <laughs> or, you know, something vague. And I can go back when I'm finalizing that outline and kind of figure out what that is. And other times I will come to that when I'm halfway through a story and I'll be like, oh, I never did figure this out. <laughs> I should probably, I should probably do that now. But at that point, I know the characters better, I know the, the plot better, and I usually have an answer. And so it's it's been kind of a really easy way to go from concept and these scattered ideas to then outline. And from there, it's pretty easy to just start writing and, and going into it. Or like, I guess I do characters too, but kind of get like some character profiles in there as well. And then kind of just, naturally happens. It's so weird. Like how does screenplay are all different ways? I, I can't tell you the, the, the biggest part of the process, you, it, 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 it's the dumbest in the world, but the empty page is the scariest thing in the world. So it's just like the way I start writing is like, I say I'm a photographer as well. So most of my films that I've written are, um, based off of an image maybe that I've taken. That's kind of where I start a lot is someone that I've captured through an image. Even though the image really has, ends up having nothing to do with the story, it's kind of like there's an image burned into my head and I start with that and I allow that to take its evolution. I'm a pretty sloppy writer in that I just start writing and I let the story and the, char the characters guide me because I, I mainly write uh, films that are seen by a singular POV of the main character. So because of that, I kind of follow that character and I learn about them. And as I learn about them, a plot evolves. But that's kind of how I start on a film of writing it from the beginning is I, I mostly comes from an image. And then that image is mostly gives me an idea for a character. And then I follow that character and then the world starts to build. And then I rewrite a lot. Um, you know, sometimes it will come you know, someone goes, Hey, I might, I, you know, have some money to make a movie. I have a small idea. What do you think? And that idea becomes a giant kernel, uh, or because a kernel that pops and suddenly you run with that idea because there's a real possibility of making it and you make it your own. I mean, that's a big thing I've learned also about filmmaking is you got to be able to sometimes make someone else's idea your own. And that's a really interesting process as well in its own right. But for writing with me, it's, it's the image comes first and then the character. And then I follow that character and I find a world and I find a plot within that character's world and I go on the ride and I try to be the first audience member and enjoy that process. Um, I like to write fast. I don't like, I'm, I never, and, and I mean, this could be also to my own detriment, but I, I don't spend a lot of time on a screenplay. I try to just write fast, get it out, push it out there. And then, then go through the, start going through the rewriting process. I show it to a group of people, um, that I trust or, you know, or attach somehow to the project, but mainly, you know, you find yourself, you always need a good sounding board and it's one of the most important elements of the writing process and of every, of every process of the film is having people that you can go, what do you think? Cause like I'm lost and, you know, kind of finding that nature of, of, uh, people that can give you notes and give you ideas and tell you when you're right or wrong or too stuck. So first draft, let's say I'm really good at plotting. Like I really, I figured out the mathematical formula to like a plot of a movie and being able to figure out exactly when everything should happen. Because really when you think about it, writing a movie, especially Hollywood movies, like I know there are movies that break the formula. But it is all math. It's all a mathematical formula. And you need certain things to happen on certain pages. And the inciting incident needs to come around here. And you need, you know, emotional character journeys to kind of happen on here. And you need this and that and the other thing. So I feel like I'm really good at um, figuring out a plot and then figuring out how it all goes down. My weak spot, definitely on the first draft, is like, why are any of these characters doing this? Or like, why do we care about them? You know, like, what are the emotional journeys like of the characters sometimes uh I, I i think of almost being secondary like i'm such a plot person that i love to figure out like what actually happens in this movie um from a b to c like how does it start what is the middle what is the end 
But then I have writer friends who are totally character people who they think of the character first and the entire backstory of that character and what happens with that character's emotional journey. And then they figure out the plot of the movie, you know, like I'm the opposite. I think of the plot of the movie and then I figure out who are these characters really like, what do they want? What are their emotional journeys? And that's what I figure out like in the rewrites, like that's what I go back in. Um, but I'm super OCD and like, I won't finish a script. I won't, if I start a script, I have to finish it. Like I won't do anything else. Um, and you know, I'll write an outline number one to a hundred. I'll, I'll just number page one to a hundred. And I'm like, what happens on every, this is every minute of the movie. This is every page. What happens on every, in every minute of this movie? Oh, on oh. page one, this is what happens. Page 15, this is what happens. Page 82, this is what happens. Page 100, this is the last scene. And I'll fill in all those gaps. And I'll put it on my desk. I'll print it up, actually print it. I'll put it on my desk. And then I'll start writing. And I'll be like, and I'll, I'm like, I'm not going to be happy until I've gotten through all 100 pages. And I'll just spend, I'll ignore all other aspects of my life. I won't go out. I won't do anything. I won't go see movies. I'll just work on it. I'll wake up at 630 in the morning and I'll work on it until my brain's fried and I can't work on it anymore. Um, and I'll just do that until I have a first draft. And the first draft often sucks, but at least it's done. And then you can set it aside, take some time off of it, and then come back to it. And the rewrite is the fun part for me. And the first thing I do is I write down page one. What happens on page one? What happens on page 30? That's the end of the first act. That's your inciting incident. Like that is your movie, right? It's what happens on page 30 is if you were to go see a trailer for the movie, page 30 is the thing that's in the trailer, right? Um, and then I, I write down what happens on page 100. Like how does it end? Like what is the ending? I need to know where this is going and then I figure out how do we get there? So. And then you fill in all the holes. You, you, you know, on page 80-ish is like the end of the second act, like dark of night. Like what's gone really bad for everybody? Like why is this the end of the second act? And then you fill in all those holes in between. But I, I like to, I like to come up with really cool endings, really cool third acts, like, and then move backwards in a way. Like I want to know where this is all going and how it ends. I feel like a lot of people. A lot of writers spend a lot of time on their first act, and then, and it, and, and and when you see a lot of movies, the first act's really awesome, and then it, they just kind of don't know what to do with it. Like they have a really good idea that they don't know what to do with. What I strive really hard to think about the second half of the movie, and then to a fault, like often people's criticisms of my work is like, yeah, your first act is really meandering or like really long, but your second half is great. So. I try to focus on the second half of the movie, but you know, the hard part being a writer is most people don't even get to the second half of that movie when they're reading your script. They read the first 10 pages and your first 10 pages, pages better blow them away. Whereas I often believe in like the slow burn of a first act of like, take it really slow and let stuff develop, um, which is to my detriment often. Um, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better at it. I don't think there's anything I've ever written that doesn't start from a personal place. Um, I used to actually be very ashamed of like, I was drawing from my family experiences a lot. So I found retrospectively that I'm often process, my writing is me trying to process something that is a lived experience or a question that I've had. So I don't know, I think something happens physically where I'm like, oh, like I can feel it in my body, the need to do, to, to say something or explore an idea. So I often have my phone. Before that, I'd have like a notebook and just, you know, ideas would just come and I'd just be scribbling on things and just like, it could be this. And like, I'd be writing as though I'm having a conversation with myself. So I'd be like, oh, maybe it could be this. Oh, and maybe she does this. And maybe, and so it just, it's just like the raw emotional flow that I'm just kind of putting down, whether it's in a document or, or handwriting or voice noting it to myself or emailing it to myself. Then I try and gather you know, there, there were times when I would like wake up at the same time every day for like whatever period I could sustain that um, and, and start building that out. But I think the, the, the thing that made a big difference in my writing process was doing some writing training. And when I first learned about, you know, 
uh, hero with a thousand faces and hero's journey and story structure and and it, it it felt like the Bible. Like it felt like oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Like it, it just kind of unlocked something in my brain. So I I, I use that now. Where um, definitely I hold space for just the 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 meaning, like the why, what am, what am I trying to say, and whatever. And then I actually start to do that and go okay. Um, outline right so um what's my setup what's my and i literally will just beat things out um i definitely write backstories all of that stuff um but yeah I, I think i'm quite a systematic writer now where i start with just the spine of things and just the major like turning points if it's a film or if it's a series the major series uh points um and then i'll do i thought to beat it out scene by scene and you know um then I actually start to go into like the cruxes of the scene. And then, so I, I, I'm pretty systematic. I, I think I, and it helps me then iterate because then I'm going, oh yeah, this moment is supposed to be the low, low of the character and um, that's not quite working and then work. It gives me um, a spine to be like just anchors. It just gives me an anchor to be able to move things around. Um, um, you know, some of my people, my writing community, people do cards and stuff. I think that's a new thing. For me, um, and I'm actually seeing the value in it, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to enjoy carding stuff. I never used to do that. But yeah, I think I'm a very systematic writer, but I do give myself a moment of just blue sky and free flow. So there's a couple different schools of thought, I guess, that writers seem to have. Um, you've got writers who think that they are God and all these characters must bow to their whim because they're the ones selling the story. I'm kind of one of those writers. There are other writers who let the story tell itself where they, they you know, basically sit back and they're just like unraveling as the characters are coming up with the ideas. I find that the people in the second group who are just letting the story tell itself are also the ones who don't outline and may get lost in the trenches along the way. I'm a serial outliner. I will not start page one until I have a bulletproof story. I will do my outline and then do a rewrite on the outline and then do a rewrite on the outline and until like the story is as flawless as I can personally make it before I even start writing the script. And then I'm just adding dialogue basically at that point. Hmm. Um, so I have complete control over everything. Uh, things might change a little bit in the drafting, like if something doesn't work once I'm actually writing up the longer version of it, then I might make some tweaks. But for the most part, it sticks almost identical to my outline or the point where I'm literally crossing off scenes on my outline as soon as I finish typing it move on to the next one um, whereas the people who don't outline and or let the characters live their own lives they seem to meander more in the story and as they're letting it go wherever it wants to go well that's a very good way to suddenly have like a 400 page script in front of you and right. you know uh, in that case I feel like those people should are more geared better towards novels you know where they can go off and on these long tangents that don't really connect to the story other than they're still using the characters. Um, so I think that's, so yeah, the two different types of writers and I find that for the most part, those who want to play God are the outliners and those who, you know, let the story live itself don't outline as much and have a tendency of either going off on tangents or just getting lost and not knowing what's coming next. I don't do like the, like the, the, the Blake Schneider like beat outline like I do full scenes like I, I basically write out full paragraphs of everything um, everything except dialogue unless I have like a really cool dialogue that pops in my head then I'll write it down but for the most part I my outlines are you know they're not super long uh, I'd say maybe between 10 and 20 pages I do a scene heading like I know like the locations I want these things so I still have slugs uh, for each of my things, even in my outline. Um, so like, you know, like this scene takes place internal office and then external house and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't sit there and number the scenes. Oh, um, I don't really feel, find that super important um, because one scene could be multiple scenes once you're in script form, you know, like if something is in, inside a house, you could have a scene in the living room and in the kitchen and in the dining room. And it's one one sequence, but then it's like broken down into like three or four scenes, you know. So I feel like numbering it isn't really going to help me much. Um, I'm still just going scene by scene or sequence by sequence as it may be anyway. I always do, like I do all the outlining myself. I don't really show my outlines to anybody. Um, and then I do my first draft and then I do my own rewrite on it before I send out anybody. So nobody sees my story until it's at least a second draft of, of the script. Um, and then luckily I get 
very good notes to find things that didn't occur to me even while reading and rereading my own stuff. Um, I feel like we have a tendency of getting lost in our own work and falling too much in love with things and then not seeing that something doesn't work because you love it. It's such a cool scene. But sometimes those really cool scenes are the things that aren't work working in any capacity other than being cool. Um, and so if you can tweak things to make them better, you should. Now, I've tried writing without an outline before. I have two scripts that I actually did write without outlining first and it was hell to write them because I didn't know what was coming next and that infuriated me so much that I'm like I don't know how to get these characters out of this because I'm just trying to write off the cuff you know and um one of those scripts hasn't like nothing's happened with it and because I'm like it's it's cool and I like it but I don't I it's it's also very short um you know like you're Features should be, you know, like the 90 to 120 page in that range, you know, the 90 to 120. And I think this script is like 82 pages. And it's because, you know, I'm writing it out and like it, nothing, nothing, there wasn't a lot of material there of like just coming up with the, the full story in script form. Whereas if I, if I were to have like outlined it first, I would have seen ahead of time, oh, my outline's kind of short. Like what else is there that needs to be? beefy you know into the story so um and then the other script that i wrote without an outline was a page quarter finalist and has been optioned by two different producers over the years you know so um i don't necessarily know that it's the process not working in the script or for the script not working but for me writing both of those scripts no matter how good one of them may have been to to get option and, and place in contest it was hell to write because i never knew what was happening and had to constantly be fixing things on the fly where and it's much harder to to fix a problem in a 90 page script than it is in like a five to ten page outline you know if you're outlining something it's only 10 pages and scenes need to be rearranged you can just move scenes around and then see how it works and reread the whole thing again in like what 15 20 minutes of reading to see if it works whereas if you move something around in a feature you could end up leaving things behind and of course then it's going to affect things in the future I would much rather rewrite, you know, if I moved something at near the end, like let's say it was on page eight of my 10 page outline, I moved to page seven. I'd rather rewrite three pages, you know, as I need to, rather than in a script having to rewrite 30 pages of stuff that because it changes everything around it. For me, I, I feel like I've gotten that old adage of, um, you know, work smarter, not harder. I think that ultimately boils down to knowing, to having a really solid, the first process is getting the log line down where you have that, the log line and you have that hint of irony. It's boiling it down to a sentence that you can pitch to somebody. Like, what's it about? And, you know, people get it right away. Um, from there, once I think you have that locked in, then it's a matter of really breaking it out into, um, you know, the main components of the story and the structure. For me, that, is where I've really become a lot more um, fastidious with my process of, you know, knowing, like again, what's the hard turn? What's the, you know, what's that inciting incident? How does it affect the character? What's sending them off to that to that first act turn point, turning point? Then from there to the bent point, and then into Act Three and how they're changing along the way. Um, I think it was, you know, I was, uh, I'm sure, like every other writer you know, obviously read the Blake Snyder, you know, Save the Cat. And I think, honestly, that's that's probably the most uh, comprehensive book on screenwriting. I, I would, I recommend that anyone who's looking to break in, I always tell them to get, you know, Save the Cat, Save the Cat goes to the movies, because I think Blake Snyder was really onto something. Um, so I really do follow, I believe it's the 16 major beats that he laid out in there and, and you know, their purpose. And for me, that really, I think, you know, I was going in that direction before I read the Blake Snyder novel, but certainly after. And, and, and he was also such an inspiring writer, um, uh, Blake Snyder was. But getting a good idea of, you know, how to, you know, really lay out the story and how to structure it that to me is is again is the most important part of the process you know i think once you have your log line and your structure you know 
you know, the writing, it's probably about 60, 70% of the process. I think the actual writing is about 30%, you know, because if you have everything lined up, you know where your character's going, you know their journey, um, it's gonna make things a lot easier for you. Um, and of course, things will always change and you have to be open and, and flexible. I know some people who write 30 page outlines, um, 40 page outlines. I usually try to keep it between six and eight pages um, just because I feel like if you're uh, with an outline like that, you sort of lose some of the momentum and the creativity where if you have a good idea and you're, you really have a good structure in place knowing you know, what, what scene comes after, what scene comes after, what scene, and it's this you know, um, uh, snowball that keeps rolling up. Um, you know, if you keep it tight in those first, in that, that outline, and then from there you can use that and then just transfer it to uh, the final, final draft or the actual script, you know, I think then you have good momentum um, to, keep, to keep the flow, the creative flow going, for sure. And giving, leaving yourself room for some flexibility because things will always come up and um, certainly has in anything that I've ever written. It's definitely evolved over time. I think that I used to just jump right into it and start trying to write it, which is not the best way of doing it. I think that outlining it is the best way to do it and making sure that you, you know, nowadays what I do is I write everything on note cards and then I start to place the note cards on my table and make sure that that is a, is a good story. And what I'll do from there is I will either do a beat sheet or an outline similar to what we would do in the writer's room, but I would create a beat sheet and then give it to my friends or give it to my readers and ask them what they think, get some feedback on that. And then also, and then, and then, you know, if I can figure out things myself, then I'll add details to the beat, she beat sheet or add details to the cards as well. From there, I can kind of get into the details of an outline, which is a little bit more in depth. And then as long as everybody that I trust has signed off on the outline, then I, I finally write the script. I could tell you how I start, because I don't, they'll have their own approaches. If, they, if they're beginning a screenplay, if they have a treatment already, then obviously they just, they should just pour it on the page. What are they seeing? Hallucinate. What is it? And don't set aside the critical element. You know, is it this or is it accomplishing? Is it this tool or that? And forget all that. Just pour it on the page and follow this and hallucinate what is happening. And write down, imagine it, and write down what it is. That, that's how they begin. When I'm writing a, a draft of a script, I don't format it in any way. It's just the dialogue, just a long list of the dialogue, um, and it's just so that it'll keep flowing. And it's not. It's just a lot. The key is to make it feel like it's fully alive. And people don't live with properly formatted dialogue. They just, things flow. Uh, and so when they're just starting out, just pour it on the page, hallucinate, try to have fun with it, be excited about it. <coughs> to me, music makes all the difference. You come up with the right score that gets you excited. And, um, and when I say hallucinate, imagine it. Imagine what the audience is going to experience have the fun that they're going to have with it. Um, there's a, this idea of imagination. Uh, in, in a screenplay, in order to do screenwriting, you've got to have imagination. But most people think that means the imagination involved in coming up with an interesting character, an interesting story. That's true. <coughs> but that's only part of it. There's really three parts, I think, in the, that imagination comes into play. The second part is coming up with imaginative uh, solutions to story problems. Because you'll run into those. You'll come in, you'll, you'll write your draft, and then somebody will say, well, this, it doesn't work from page 30 on because of that. And you don't want to throw out 90 pages. So you say, well, why isn't it working? Oh, I bet we can solve it this way. We, we go this way. Um, and then that'll take care of that problem. Uh, and sometimes uh, it, it, it can be something very simple. But being imaginative about solving these problems. Um, then the third part is being able to constantly imagine that you are the audience that hasn't seen it before, that you're watching it for the first time and keeping track of that. Uh, what are we seeing? What, what are my expectations? What am I afraid of? That, that part of it. And that's fun. You know, you are, you, you're inspired to make movies because you are thrilled by movies. So be that, let that thrill happen while you're writing it. This is exciting what you're doing. 
I mean, I think the reason I got interested in making art in the first place is to deal with, you know, fears and, and sort of existential ideas and to get a better understanding of like what it is to exist um, and what it is to relate to other people. And so, you know, th those kind of existential ideas are, are um, the things that drive me to create art that, that I love in see seeing in art and the things that drive me to create art. So. Um, when I'm looking at films, I, I absolutely love thematically driven films and, um, you know, the, the sort of meaning of life, I guess, for, for lack of a better way to put it, and the, and the idea of what, you know, what we're facing. How do we face death? What does it mean to die? Um, how do we experience that is, is really interesting topics to me. Well, usually I start out with uh, theme as a, a, you know, as a, at the ground level, at that sort of nugget level of storytelling, I think about what is the the topic that I want to explore? So I know a lot of people are like, oh, I have this idea for a story. This is the character. This is what they do, you know, so on. For me, it's more often like, this is a really interesting kind of topic. Now, this is the topic I want to explore. Here's what I think about it. Now, how do I create characters and how do I create a story that help me to explore that? Um, so it, it, maybe that's an opposite approach of many people who are like, oh, I've got this character, I'm gonna put them in this world, and now maybe I'll think about a theme later. I'm more like, what is it that I wanna say? Why don't, because to me, if I don't have something that I wanna say, why am I making the movie, right? Why, why bother making a movie if, you have, if you've got nothing to say? I guess if you're, you know, if it's just revenue or you know, you're making a popcorn movie to get paid or something like that, that's fine, and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, if I'm, if I'm creating something that's our kind of real creative art, um, I have to think about what's important to me at this moment, how do I want to express that, and then how can I build that from that idea? And so every character behavior, every character uh, typically takes a different perspective on that theme. That's, that's one of the approaches I have. I say, what, you know, here's, here's a character. How would this character relate to this theme? How would they behave in association with this theme? Here's another character. Um, Maybe it's a contrastive character, for example. I mean, you, you might be a protagonist, antagonist, but it might not. It might be other types of characters. Uh, how do they relate to this theme? How would they behave in association with that? And now what is the story that allows me to kind of go on a journey with those characters that reinforces whatever my uh, thesis is associated with it? So again, that, uh, that the beginning and ending are really important to me because um, you have to, tell the audience where you're starting, place everything, set it up there, and then at the end, you have to drive home what is the thesis, what is the idea that you want them to, to walk away with. Uh, and some of that is maybe because I come from academic writing, so I'm used to the, the, the idea of you know, write, writing uh, a, a kind of a persuasive academic article, and it's really that, that same type of, type of approach. You know, you're trying to, to tell somebody, here's what I believe in, in the scientific realm, here's the evidence of that, and then here's the conclusion. You make a big mess and then try to pluck the good stuff out. Uh, I sit down with a legal pad and I write down little tiny bios, uh, lines, um, basic stories, conflicts, secrets, all that kind of stuff. And I don't like, like it's not neat. Like there's circles and lines and scribbles and stuff to X'd out. And, and I only use one side so I can just keep going. And then I will go back through and, okay, that's kind of interesting. That's sort of good. That's kind of interesting. All this stuff I'll get to. And I, no lie, have stacks of yellow legal pads that are from projects. So I think when you're building a story, it's your you know your character has to want something, have obstacles and all that stuff. But I also think like you have to have fun making the character do stuff. Like it's the old get your character in a tree and throw rocks at them. Um, like this should be fun for the audience. This should be fun for you. This should be fun. I definitely do my best to try to put it into a log line first because the classic save the cat book very much harps on that and i'm sure every young writer reads it and is like ah please i got this great life thing or whatever and i'm gonna figure it out as i go but it'll save a lot of time so i try to do a log line um if i can't if i just haven't totally cracked the log line i'll do an outline um 
and I'll try, I'll just be really easy on myself. I won't try to make this whole grand scheme write the whole 110 pages or whatever immediately. I'll, I'll write the beginning, I'll write the end, which is where this, you know, character art comes in. This guy starts with this, he ends with that. And then just fill in that like sandwich in a weird way, you know, then find out the midpoint, like what's the major factor there and, and then go through the, the rest of the kind of the major beat points. And um, someone said this to me recently, I haven't actually done this much, but they'll write out every, like once they have all the scenes done, they'll write out the, the heading to every scene in a script. And then they'll just go back and do dialogue and like fill it in that way. And I really like that. So I'll probably be doing that next time. It's just a good way to be like, to track where you are and not write 15 pages of a monologue that you're gonna cut. I think the first steps when I, when I begin to write is a lot of thinking about, thinking about it. Like I don't, I'm not really good at just sitting down and starting to bang it out. And I don't really, oftentimes I don't write an outline. It's not like I have to make an outline first and then write the script. So for me, usually it's a couple of ideas that just won't go away. And so if those ideas won't go away, then that means that there's something, hopefully there's something there. And I just let it percolate. And it has a sort of magnetic, if it's a good idea, and these are rare, because it's not like I have like, I've never been one of those guys that just like, you know, is able to spin a good yarn and have a million stories I want to tell. But in the case of Search and Rescue, it was just a couple of ideas started to sort of bind together. And I think some of them were ideas that I had for other movies that didn't go anywhere. Like in other words, they were that's in, it's now that I think about it, there were there were several different ideas and characters that had been I had been developing for other movies that didn't sustain themselves. They were good, but they didn't for some reason they didn't belong in whatever movie I was think I was trying to make. And so it all started to kind of combine into this one film. But you know what, I, you know that's specific to this particular movie and every writing every writing process is different. You know, if somebody comes to me and says, I need you to write Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus in two weeks, that's a different that's a different process. That's when you sit down and, you know, figure out, you know, okay, act one, this that should happen, then this should you know, that's when I do that. So so, you know, work for hire that has to be of a of a you know I think that's easier, uh, a simpler genre is easier to do than, than, than this. But I really did have to think about it and I really did have to draw from a lot of things that had been dormant, ideas that had been dormant that sort of all sort of coalesced to, to form this thing. That's how it started. Then I did, then of course I had to sit down and write every day. Like everybody else, you have to write it. You know, you can think about it all day long, but you have to write it. You know, I kept talking about it and my wife was finally like, you, should, you need to write this thing. You just need to do it. You know, and with, certainly without Valerie's you know, insisting that I just, you know, get down to it, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I did. I just basically realized that if I got up at, you know, five in the morning every day, that I would be in this kind of, you know, a lot of writers talk about this, this kind of like haze where you're not really judging, you're not in a, in a critical mind, you're just sort of in a semi-dream state. But if I got up at five and wrote for like till nine or something like that, you know, if I wrote for three or four hours in the morning, that I could bang out you know, without me judging myself, I would just knock out, you know, four pages or three or four or five if it was a good day. And I just did that, you know, over, you know, however long it was, a month. I just, just every day, just knocked out a little bit. So at least, you know, after, if you do the math, I mean, five pages a day at times 20 days, is what, 100 pages. So in, with inside of a month, you can get a draft done. And then you go back and you're like, oh, this is, and this doesn't work and you actually are able to tackle it uh, critically, but at least the hard part of just getting it out was accomplished if I was diligent and got up and just did it. And that's hard, you know, it's like going to the gym or whatever. That's what that, that takes, you know, anybody will tell you that's, and some days you don't have anything. Sometimes you just sit there, you know, and you're just like, you know, I got one line. But I think as all writers, will, real writers will tell you that's like what's necessary. The writer writes, you can't expect to just not do it and then have great stuff pour out. You have to go to the gym, you know? So that's how it, that's how it happened. Begin with character, end with character, find the story in between. I don't care what paradigm people have in terms of story structure. 
how you get there is critical. And so you start with your characters. That's my take. You know, it, it, again, there's not one right way to do this. I'm just saying that this, I think, is a, is a smart way to go about it. Because the characters, it's their story. If we're writing a story, we are assuming that in some magical, mystical way, that story universe exists. Those characters exist. And if it's their story, they know it better than we do. And so character development is about getting curious. It's about asking questions. It's about spending time with the characters. And so the typical things that we see like biographies and questionnaires, those are great. I call those indirect engagement exercises because you're reflecting on the character. You're thinking about the character as opposed to direct engagement exercises. So for example, what if I have a character in mind, I'm going to imagine I'm a psychiatrist. This character is my patient. And if they're reticent to talk to me, I can even go one step further. They have been court appointed to appear with me as a psychiatrist, and they have to answer my questions. If they don't, they will stay stuck in this situation until they do. So you just create a situation in which, like I was saying earlier, you just ask questions. You get curious. When I was, that, that's a lesson I learned when I was in Air Force Brat. You just ask people questions, you begin talking. And so you just, you type, you just let it go. You can even do something, um, it's a little bit spiritual, I suppose you'd say in a way, where you're gonna do um, either a monologue or a stream of consciousness with the character. It's sort of like a Vulcan mind melt, you know, like Star Trek, where you get a character in your mind and you do some deep breathing, you get yourself, so you're transitioning out of the busy world and you're gonna be here now with this character and you set a timer for like 15 minutes and you put your fingers on the keyboard or pen on paper and you close your eyes and you just type and you just type and you know your mind will go, oh, I gotta get groceries or the cat and whatever. Just let that go. You don't get attached to it. You just keep coming back to this character and you get done with this. And so you've got all these words that you've typed out. Some of them are like dialogue, like a monologue, and some of them are just like stream of consciousness. 80% of it may seem like gobbledygook to you, maybe 90%, but 20% or 10%, there's something really interesting that popped out there. And that's getting in touch with the characters in a, at a subconscious level. And they start to talk to you. I've seen this happen time and time again. I created a, a prep class 10 years ago that I teach online, six week workshop, taking a story from concept to outline. And the first four weeks are all character development. The, the second week is brainstorming. That's all they do is brainstorm. And I've had hundreds of people tell me that was the most eye-opening experience for them, was doing that type of work. Again, the characters exist. We act on that belief. And we reach out to them and get them talking to us. So the character development, that's, those are some great examples for character development. What can happen out of that is if you identify a protagonist in particular, their state of disunity, where they are disconnected from their authentic nature, and that can inform, if you know what the disunity state is, that can inform where the unity state is. And so now they're not gonna just jump there. Then you're gonna say, okay, so these plot elements and the characters with whom they intersect, they're gonna deconstruct their old ways of being because they don't work out here in the new world. But in the process of that, they're gonna uncover their need. Their need's going to start to emerge. This is very Jungian. Jung talks about, he says, when an inner situation is not made conscious, and he's talking about like conflict, inner conflict, it happens outside as fate. Now, I don't know if that's real in, you know, in the real world, but that's the protagonist's story. The protagonist starts off in a state of disunity and what happens in the plot is informed by that. There's a synergy between it. It's not just these random events. It's like these characters that they intersect with and the events that they go through, that's going to provide the basis of their transformation. And so their disunity, that gets deconstructed. Well, now this stuff starts to come out into the light of consciousness, their need and then they move into reconstruction. Now they're moving into their new mode of being and eventually toward unity. So you can take that raw material that you get with your, with your characters and see how that starts to shape the nature of the plot, the story structure. 
And it's not just plugging this in, you know, this has to happen on page 25, the, the break into act two. No, you're doing it through a much more organic fashion with your characters and letting them inform you what, what the structure will be. And the final value of that is that you're writing multi-layered, richly textured characters who actors want to play. So character development to me is like everything. It, it, uh, it's absolutely critical. One of the best creative decisions I've ever made was joining a writing group. I was in a bubble for a very long time, um, but it's also hard to find a writing group where everyone knows how to give notes um, and knows how to take notes. And so I've been, I was very lucky because what we have is very unique and the people within that writing group understand that too. And I've gotten jobs out of this writing group. You know, we're all kind of looking out for each other. There's only eight of us, but um, I, you know, I was a type that would just turn in pages and say, okay, this is what my, and they're like, well, we don't know where the story's going. Can you just outline it for us? And I'm like, no, I don't outline. Just follow <laughs> this, give me the notes on the pages. Like, yeah, well, we can't give you notes. We don't know where the story's going. And so then I had to think about how do I do that? And I, I started writing, um, learning how to write treatment, you know, and, and that was great. First practice in terms of just writing a treatment makes it very easy for you to pitch your script. Um, so there's that skill and then outlining it, you know, when I would get lost, normally when I'm writing a script, right, I'm just going and I get to a point and I don't know where the story is going to go from there. That's normally how I would write. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it, but that's how I would do it. And then I would, something would strike me or I would know, okay, well over here, I know this is going to happen. So let me just start there. So these huge gaps in my scripts, and then I would connect those gaps. Well, now I outline my entire script, my entire story. First, I'll take those from notes. So I'll have a notebook with me everywhere I go. So it doesn't matter where I'm at, an idea will come and I'll write it down. And um, I'm starting to get into recording, but I'm very old school. So I start just writing down and a page of notes in my little notebook will be about 10 pages of script. So I'll usually then on my writing day will translate that to those 10 pages. Um, but now, that was the old way. Now I will outline everything. So I'll outline the entire story and I'm able to write my scripts a lot faster because of that. Because I already know where the story is going to go. The dialogue, the characters are fleshed out and the dialogue will comes a lot easier and a lot faster. So I definitely recommend that, but you have to learn how to outline. You have to learn how to write a treatment. You have to learn how to com um, convert your notes to those things. Me, I just started writing scripts because that's what I, I, I understood the script, right? And started writing there, but that was a, a very stop-start kind of, kind of way. I like to, now it's just like a fluid, like, like playing a piano. You know, once the outline's done and I start the screenplay, it's like playing a piano for me. I personally, um, I turned out to write very well in short bursts. I thought I should do more because when I'm writing in a short burst, it's like, holy crap, if I could keep doing this for eight hours, I'd be a miracle. Um, but I can't. <laughs> and I would sit there and I would grind. After the burst was running down, I would grind. And not only would that be unproductive and begin to be disheartening, but I would start to undo my good work. Because when you start to grind in a bad way, you start to doubt, you start to feel bad and you say, well, I must be feeling bad because this work is bad which is not necessarily the case. It could be that your process is bad. Um, and so what I would do is I would write something really good and then I would grind until I was unhappy and then I would say, oh, that sucks. And then I would write something over it and destroy my own good work. And it took me a long time to pay attention to the fact that I do really well in short bursts. And if I stop when I feel myself starting to lose it and take a break, take a walk, do exercises, whatever, I can then come back and do another short burst. Getting myself to sit down again is rough, but that's the thing I had to teach myself by paying attention to what worked. I think writing is inherently like the only person you're battling is yourself, really, most of the time. Because, uh, and I think in particular, uh, at least for me, I can only speak to my experience, but I, I struggle a lot with like self-hatred. Like, I, I, there's lots of parts of myself that I hate and uh, I'm only sort of just now getting over a lot of these types of things, but like when it's just you and a blank screen and a cursor flashing, sometimes like all of your insecurities and things just bubble up and it gets in the way of you 
of you getting your creative thoughts onto the page. And I've learned just for me, like when I'm able to give myself permission to write the worst, most terrible pages of all time, then I can do it. And then I know in my, uh, like in my back pocket, I know that writing is a process. So I know that like whatever I try on my first attempt is probably not going to be very good. In fact, like, you know, the, the terrible first draft is like, that's just kind of a law in how I see it. There are other people who I'm sure are, are brilliant that can pump out a genius first draft. I am not that person. I will never be that person. And so for me, um, when I'm allowed to give myself grace and allow myself to write terribly, to just write things that don't make sense, to write sentence fragments, to write, and then they fight, I'll come back later and then keep going. You know what I mean? Like when I allow myself that sort of level of freedom, then I can write. And I feel like on paper, I shouldn't be a writer because I'm like, my self-criticism in my brain is pretty fierce and sometimes it's unbearable. But I think that you, you do, you have to give yourself grace and you have to like, again, I don't want to be too new agey, but you got to like <laughs> kind of love yourself. You know what I mean? You have to be okay with, yep, these are some terrible words, but you know, they're words and that's all that matters right now. In this particular instance, the only thing that matters is like I'm putting words onto the page. They don't have to be the right words. They don't have to be in the right order, but they're words. And for, at least for a first draft, that's the, that's the thing that I think when I learned that sort of like, you know, unlocked in my brain, I'm just like, oh, this draft doesn't count. It doesn't count because I'm going to, I can go back and fix it later. Um, and so writing with a, a reckless abandon of like, this doesn't have to be good. This is supposed to be bad. Anyone can write a terrible thing. You know what I mean? Uh, terrible just in terms of the mechanics of the words. Like anybody can write something terrible. You know, and like, that's how I find my entry into it. It's like, if I, I know for a fact that I can write something terrible. If my goal is to sit down and be a genius, I can't hit that every day, but I can hit being really bad every day. And so that's my only uh, metric of success is like, are there words on the page? Yes, I don't, my metric of success is not, are they good words? Is this good? That's for, that's for later. When I'm doing writing, I don't necessarily do a traditional treatment. My outline just seems to morph into a treatment. So all my outlines are, be are bullet points in between the big beats. So in between those big beats are bullet points of what's happening, why it's happening. You know, if I hear dialogue, I might put a bit in. Um, I won't write it, I won't format it, but I'll have my character, if I hear my character say something in service of that beat, I'll write that in. So it becomes this like worksheet that I then keep rewriting and rewriting until it becomes almost a treatment. So eventually in the bullet points, I'll start to put in slug lines, right? And then what's happening in that scene, who's in the scene, what they might say, but not in a screenplay format. That's essential for me so that when I get into the screenplay itself, I'm more focused on the formatting of the screenplay, you know, and the structure and the rewriting of description and transitions between scenes and how does that play, you know, and what is this sequence? So I'm then plugging in the first draft. It's like a, I'm plugging the, I, I literally cut and paste the entire outline into the screenplay format. And then I just play with it that way and I format it and then I rewrite it. Before it gets, you know, before it would get to my manager, I've probably rewritten it 20 times. So the outline for me is that foundation to the story. It's a foundation and a place to discover the character. It's a place where I can be literary, where I can do swaths of description if I want to. You know, I can exercise my literary side knowing that when it goes into the script, I have to cut it all, which is never happy for me. But, you know, that's, that's why an outline is important. I just have to know those big beats and what's happening in between so I can then really focus on the structure and formatting of the first draft. I'll spend quite a bit of time outlining before I even write the full, like I'll usually have a complete full outline and then jump into the story. So I'll have a really specific idea of the objective of every single scene. Um, and ultimately it saves me time. 
uh, when I first started writing, I was anti-outline. I kind of had the uh, attitude, you know, it's the young attitude of just like, you know, I'm just going to write and my, my gut's going to tell me what's right and what it's meaningful and stuff like that. And that works for a lot of writers. But I noticed that I would hit a lot of dead ends and I became emotionally attached to those dead ends. And then it became really hard to rewrite until I just drove my stories off the cliff. And so little by little, the more I, you know, honestly, that Ron Media 24 plot point thing was huge because it was, it was so simple. You could literally sit there and just plot out a story in an hour and you'd have a really good idea of where it was going. And then from there, you're, you know, that's, to me, that's when you go from like, you know, discovering your story to actually becoming a craftsman or a craftsperson where you're working on the story and taking control of it. And then you start to st take a step back and then... You know, it, it's almost like a render machine. You're rendering your story before you ever sit down and write it. So then the script really just becomes kind of a, a secondary artifact of all the work that you've put into it. So yeah, I spend a lot of time outlining. It, it's, and it's, you know, a lot of people feel like it takes away from the creative process. Usually that's kind of the writer saying, well, I want to be in the audience too. And I want to experience and be surprised by it. But outlining doesn't take away from that because what happens when you sit down, like you've outlined, you've got your outline right here. And then when you're writing, you put yourself in the moment, you're, you're in the skin of the writer or of the character and you, you're experiencing it. And then if your gut tells you to try something different, try something different, see where it goes. So you're still, you know, the whole um, uh, gardener versus architect, the pantser versus plotter kind of thing. I call it, what is it? The... Uh, the assassin versus the berserker. Um, basically, the idea, like the the planner versus the person that just sees what happens next. And I, I think it's important to to um, understand the consequences of the choices you're making. But the whole process of writing is an experiment. Art is an experiment. And the the only thing that rules it is: do we make it emotionally resonant for somebody else? And as artists, we get to decide how much that is, like how, how we build that relationship. If we want to do it as a li like for a living, then we become responsible to those people that are investing in us. And that's, that's when you want to be able to, uh, to have control of your craft. That's when you want to be able to, you know, climb the mountain, know how you're going to get up there because you've got to meet a deadline. You know, it's, there aren't a lot of producers that are going to be like, all right, you know, we needed this three months ago and you're still just kind of wandering in the weeds. But a lot of the process of writing is experimenting in the weeds, going into the weeds and then stepping back. And the trick is just not, not panicking when you're in the weeds and saying, okay, this is part of the process. Let's step back and look at the, let's look at the outline and see if this is going to work. So for me, it feels like it's like, um, like a map. You're zooming in and you, know, you can do the, the street view where you're in the character and you're just driving along and you're like, yeah, I feel this. I'm going through this street. And that's when you're writing. But then you pull back, you zoom out, and you see the overview of where you're going, and that's the outline. I have two answers for if I have a writing routine that I follow. And one is, yes, I have a writing routine. Two is I don't always follow that writing routine. The best work I've ever done was when I followed that routine. But for some reasons, I, I don't follow it all the time. And it's tough. And sometimes it's because of just what else I have going on in my life. That routine that I really liked and worked for me didn't, um, it, it's, it's just no longer sort of an option for, for what I have going on right now. And other times it's just tough to just sit down at the desk and write, even though I know I already have a plan to do that. It's just tough, you know, you don't want to. And so sometimes I don't. I fail at sitting down and writing. But when I was following it, it was great. And when I do follow it, it's great because it forces me to write. And the routine was basically I would get up and two hours in the morning I would write. And then that was it for the day. As far as official writing time, I would still pull out a notebook or if I was really inspired, I might open the computer and, and write some more. But those two hours, I would set the timer and I would write. At the end of that two hours, I would stop, no matter where I was, no matter whether I felt like I could keep going for another two or 
I was like, thank God, I just I barely made those two hours. That felt like a slog. Um, but having it be time-based told me that it doesn't matter what I've written as long as I've shown up and I have written. And so some days those two hours would produce you know, 10 pages, other days it would produce one. But I was measuring whether or not I was doing my job by the time I was spending doing it and not necessarily the page count or the word count. Because I think that so much of what we do is up here and it doesn't always translate to the pages. And so that one page that I wrote over that two hours, that might have been really difficult and was a lot of thinking and feeling and kind of moving through what was going on there. And that one page is great output for those two hours. And those other 10 pages I wrote the day before might not be great. So I shouldn't measure my progress with what was going on the page, but more about the fact that I could sit down, show up, and do the job. Give me three words about this story. It could be just three, three words. Revenge, um, another word. So we'll, we'll start with those words. Then give me a character. Who do you want in the character? Then I'll go ask, okay, where does this take place? Um, get the character. What's the character's job? What does that person do? And what does that character want to do? And then develop the world, develop the character, and why do you want to tell that story? And we'll start from there and then go out, go back, and then just even if it's one page or two page or three pages, um, write something about what this character does in that world with their job and what, and what, what they want to do. And then once you have that, then we could flesh it out a little bit more. And then, then maybe, like you said, start an outline. Um, what, what, what do they need? What's their obstacles? Um, and, and then we add more characters in. But I, I would probably start with um, who, the, who the main character is and, um, and the world they're in. I usually I email them to myself, so I have all these random emails that, that half the time don't make sense. Like you know, you know, second act all on on a plane, giant fight. You know, guy loses his wife. You know, hitman finds out his ex wife is married to somebody else. You know, things like that. So I have all these weird random things. But then once I really dig in, I have a process to figure out if something can be a script. And usually it's I figure out the entire first act beat by beat by beat, like the first 20 pages. This happens, that happens, this happens, like the first six or seven scenes. Then I know what happens in the second act turn, kind of what shifts the movie or the story, and then how it ends. And if I can figure all that out, then I know I pretty much can write a pretty good script. So that's usually what I do first. I don't want to know the whole story beat by beat by beat because I figure some things out along the way that I would have never thought of. Now there's other times I've kind of thought the whole thing out almost, you know, in, in more, you know, bigger beats and bigger sections, but that's usually what I do is I know the first act, how it ends, what happens in the middle, and then what happens at the end, and that's it. If we're really going to like the start start, I'm watching a movie that I love. Like I like my my aforementioned Matrix revisit revisiting where I was like Ideas were just fireworks in my brain after that. I have to, you know, all these ideas are, are populating up there. Um, from there, you know, you, you have now this energy that's like just glowing inside of you to create. And that's where I start being like, okay, what, what can I, you know, I'm seeing elements of this that really inspired me. What elements of this can I take to create something that's my own? And, and then that's where I'll start toying around with a scene. It usually just starts with one scene where I'll, I'll see that so crystal clear it's one of my favorite moments of, of the creation process. Um, and, then, and then to write that scene. I, I don't always start a script from the very beginning. I'll sometimes start what I see the clearest. So I'll start with that. And then, you know, once you, you've looked at that scene and you kind of, all right, is the rest of the story starting to fall into place? Do I see what's going to be happening now in this story? And if the answer is yes, keep going. So then, then I might start from the very beginning. Okay, let's get work our way up to this scene and try and get there. Um, so I'll, you know, do the draft. Usually the first draft is, I don't want to call it a mess because I don't think it's a mess, but it's, it's not, it's not textbook 
screenwriting. You know, it's not perfect. The actions aren't purely actions. The actions are a little bit descriptive up there. Like I'm like living in that flowery description on my screen, in my first draft of my screenplay. Um, and I, and I just love it. Uh, I think Mark Duplass referred to the first draft like that as like the vomit draft. You're just getting the idea out. Um, and, and that's the perfect, uh, analogy for it. You're just, you know, get this idea out, but I don't know. It's a gross analogy, but you know, you get it. <laughs> um, so anyways, you know, you do that draft and then that's where, all right, are we going to do this? Are we going to find the elbow grease to like lift this up and like tighten this script? And, you know, usually around this point, Aaron has already been aware of like my passion for this script. Like, is this something you're interested in too? Because I mean, hey, he's going to be the one directing. So is he going to be attached as the director? And we'll kind of come together and like start talking about the project together. He'll usually at this point take it. And uh, if, he, if he hasn't already, sometimes we're both in the same stage together, but uh, he'll he'll then take it and start really like polishing it up. And he does such a phenomenal job of of absolutely tightening a script. Anything that's extra superfluous that I've been like putting in there because, hey, pizzazz, and it needs to be in there, right? It doesn't need to be in there. He takes it out. He can see as the director exactly what it's gonna be. And so he takes it out and he'll, he'll really tighten it. And it becomes this beautiful, well-oiled machine. And I'm so grateful because once he's had his hands on it, I mean, if he, he'll kick it back to me, I'll read things and sometimes I, I'll be like, oh no, you didn't see what needed to be here in this scene. Did you not see the emotional travesty that needed? Oh no, this has to come back. You know, so then that's when we kick it back and forth. And I mean, that's the fun, nerve wracking, probably in Aaron's opinion, nerve wracking portion of the, the uh, collaborative script writing process between us. Um, Cause I'm a very passionate writer, if you can't tell. Um, um, but we, we're always like on the same team. We're always on the same team, rowing in the same direction to finish this script and make it the best possible project. There are things you're supposed to do as a writer that you should do. Um, you should make an outline, you should make your character breakdowns. There's all these things that you like do. You make your cards and you plot out your story or first and second, and third. I don't do any of that. I do none of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the perfect screenwriter. Yes. That's when it has the folded sock drawer. Yes. Yep. That's mm -hmm. the guy who does it all correctly. I don't do any of that. <laughs> I like to sit and think about the idea. And then I like to think about the character, who that woman or man is and what they're like and what their world looks like. And then I just start to think about what the movie might look like in my head. And once I sort of start seeing the movie itself in my head, then I start writing it. I don't know how it's gonna end necessarily, unless it's a thriller. If it's a thriller, I need to know how it's gonna end so I can know where I gotta go, if that makes sense. You know, because you always wanna have that ending that people go, oh. so you think of the ending first. Like, what would be a cool, and then, oh, okay, now how do I get there? So I go backward if it's a thriller. If it's not a thriller, if it's just a story about people and life and love or whatever it is, then I don't really think that much about what's going to happen. I just sort of think about the people and where they are and where I want them to be, what the world's like, what they enjoy. There's usually a lot of wine involved because I enjoy some wine. Um, and... Uh, what happens is I end up writing, I think, something that's much more uh, organic and much more, um, here I am a writer and I can't find a word. Uh, what is the word? Organic and what is it? What's, what's the word when something just spontaneous? Spontaneous. Okay. Organic, I end up writing something that's more organic and spontaneous because I haven't sort of telegraphed it. And kind of like when you're acting, you know, you always hear, don't play result, you know, because you've read the entire script. So your character is on a journey. So you know what that journey is, but the character doesn't know. So you don't want to play like you know what's coming because you'll telegraph it to the audience. I find the same thing works for me as a writer. By not knowing everything when I'm writing, I'm discovering it as I'm writing and it makes the writing process exciting for me because I'm like sitting there at the keyboard. I'm like, this is great. You know, people are like, well, what's going to happen next? Like, I don't know. I can't wait to find out either. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a spontaneous thing. Um, and then hopefully the training and, and, and the laws of inevitability that I try to keep focused in my head 
you know, kick in as I'm writing. And when it's done, it's, it's a really great, it's a really great story. But yeah, I, 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 I like to look at it as a living, breathing story that's unfolding as if I'm watching it. Um, and that drives me toward the end because I feel like if I do all the outline stuff for me, if I do all the outline stuff, I've already kind of done it already. So now it's like, ah, oh, now I got to write it all. I did all the, I already figured it out. So I just like to jump in and start writing. I will outline to like 90% of the way there. I will outline as much as I feel like I can um, before I actually start writing. Um, I find it personally very difficult to, to do it any other way. Um, I do think there is a lot of value in sort of, again, exploring and having that sort of creativity. But to me, a, a lot of that is the outlining. And I think also the reality is, is even if you outline something like 99% of the way done, when you actually write it, that won't be what it'll be anyway. It's a, it's a roadmap that, that will change. It just is what it is, um, at least the way I do it. I think that also in addition to that, it's really important to know like as much as you can about the characters and the themes and the ideas that you want to explore before, again, before I start writing, writing. I do do a lot of ex exploring of these things in a much more sort of nebulous way. Um, trying to think of like what else. I don't, it doesn't really matter to me if the outline's in order. I'll just outline the chunks of it that I understand. I personally, and again, this is, this is the hard thing about this because I do think everyone is different. To me, to me, a lot of the sort of outlining is very sort of mathematical. And it's like knowing like, okay, like there has to be, there will be this many scenes and like, and these are, you know, where the big, you know, the very large beats happen, the midpoint and the act two climax and the inciting incident and those sort of things. And then if you can start filling in, like literally even, I guess this is where like note cards come from. For some people, I don't use note cards, but I'll have like an equivalent on like the computer where I just start like filling in. I like these scenes and I know this should happen about here because I'm trying to get to this big moment here. And now I feel like, okay, but this is kind of empty, like in the sort of like whatever the the 30 to 50 minute mark. So I need to start filling that in. I guess it, it, it is organic, but it starts with understanding that it's a skeleton and knowing what the major organs are. Usually, I would find it hard if I didn't have a good sense of like, okay, in general, if it's this type of story, if it's a, like I'm trying to think of some like very simple if it's a rom-com, right, you know the act two climax is they're gonna fall out of whatever, there's gonna be the conflict between the two main leads, right, and they're gonna split up. Like, if I know that, and now I know these characters and I have a good sense because I have a sort of general sense of the story that like they need to be here at that moment, I can then start filling out the rest of it. If I know these sort of big moments I can start figuring out how we got there and like and where we needed to start. And then at that point it is kind of organic and it just sort of goes where inspiration is not exactly right, but like where the material is taking you, if that makes sense. Again, I think this is probably what most people do, like actually writing pages. It's just for me, I don't do that on the page. I, I do all that work or as much of that work as possible before I actually sit down and start doing pages. Um, because that to me is too confusing to keep track of. To me, it's, it's how do I create an effective roadmap for myself? 
um, to ensure that when this is done there will be a movie and that movie will be telling the story that I set out to tell or something close. Somebody once said, and I thought it was a smart thing, the rules of screenwriting are for when the script doesn't work. So that, you know, if, if you go, I mean, you shouldn't have to give it to someone for them to tell you, this is completely meaningless to me. I don't get it at all. Uh, it's really our job to having written to go back and then start shaping it in a more refined way. And as one gets more practice at it, uh, you instinctively start to avoid some of the potholes and you sense, oh, this is going on too long or whatever. But, but first, it's important to get it down. Um, it's also a test uh, for younger writers who uh, are used to writing in, in, in a medium on a device that allows them to just blurt everything out. And it looks like a script. It's in Final Draft. It looks like a script, so it, it must be good. Well, it's not good. Uh, you have to force yourself to go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and refine it. Put it away, take, pick it up, look at it again. Uh, this is all presupposing, of course, that, the, that the, before you start writing dialogue and scenes, first it has to be properly structured. So that first, uh, most of the projects that, whether it's in movies or television, most of our time is spent in structuring the story properly, not just blurting out dialogue. The dialogue is the easy part. Um, so once it's properly structured, then you're usually not going to go too far afield. But, the, but even that, 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 that theory of writing from passion applies to the structuring of the story as well. You want to you picture it in your head and, and get the thing structured in a way that is that in which the passion of your idea first and foremost comes through. That's the, that's the most important thing. Without that, you're just writing another screenplay that will disappear with all the thousands and thousands of other mediocre screenplays. Somebody was like, I want to write a movie and I don't know anything about it. I'd be like, what do you want to write about? Like, what's your idea? And they probably have the idea. They're not like, well, I don't know what the idea is. Though they're going to be like, well, actually, I want to write about this guy who wants to do this thing. And I'd be like, okay, start describing it. Just describe it. And then I might say something like, don't, don't talk, don't describe their thoughts and don't describe their feelings, any character. Don't describe the insides. Just describe what you would see on a, on a movie screen. You know, just like, and you know, exterior house day, man walks across and gets in the car, drives away. You know, do not care about doing anything wrong. Just spill your guts. Just tell us the movie. Write down the whole movie. We'll figure all that other stuff later. You can figure out where things are supposed to be later. You can figure out everything. I mean, you know, there's so many stories about that where they didn't know what they were doing. You know, they wrote Bridesmaids that way. They didn't know why they brought, they bought screenwriting for dummies or something like that, right? So it's like that fresh voice, it's like, ah, oh, it breaks my heart thinking about all the people that have, that think they have because we've created this industry where it's all coded and they got to go take, oh, you got to learn. You have to learn structure. You have to learn this. You've got to learn all these things. You got to know what a screenplay is, man. You got to know what the rules are before you break them. That's all crap to sell books and all sorts of stuff. It doesn't it's, it, we, oh God, please bring them in that don't know anything about movies and maybe we'll have better movies. I mean, that's the problem. It's like, it's like all this other stuff. It's like bring in that person. It's just like, I have, as a teacher, I have had people come in with formatting that's just like, does not, they don't know what, they don't have access to final draft. I don't know what they're writing. And it's the most authentic slice of life, funny, succinct observational genius stuff and they don't know and the, the reason why it exists is because they haven't learned anything about screenwriting yet and then once you start teaching them then all of a sudden they they they, they don't know what they're doing then they don't then they lose their emotional connection they lose that story four-year-olds know how to tell a story they know how to tell a story. Ask a five-year-old, what happened today at school? Well, we went in, beginning, middle, and end, the inciting incident. You can tape it. You can go, inciting incident. So you guys should film courage to do. You should interview <laughs> a friggin' 10-year-old and then put the little flags in and be like, wow, they know all the structure already. So I don't have to go 
to so-and-so person's course or I don't have to take Gordy's class or anything. You know, you don't have to spend any money and keep your voice. That's the most important thing I was a, it's like, don't lose your voice. Don't lose your instincts, your childlike instincts for telling stories. I think the best part of writing a script is when you actually, you've actually written enough of the beginning, the middle and the end that you have visualized the whole entire puzzle in a certain way. So now you're just along for the ride and it's not, it's not like painful and hard and trying to figure anything out. You figured it out. Now it's just like, I'm gonna sit down and write this scene, or I'm gonna put that scene, I'm gonna put this scene here, I'm gonna put this scene here, because I think of screenwriting like a puzzle. I very rarely write in chronological order. I will literally write a scene that I know is gonna be in the movie. I might write the ending. I mean, I literally, and then I'll start moving, oh no, the scene goes here, the scene goes here. Now some people do that with um, index cards, like they'll write, Put, put the thing together with index cards. I just do it in the script. I just cut and paste and put that scene there and I'll like write a scene and then just go more, 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 knowing that I'm gonna write more scenes there, but knowing that I needed to write that scene. So I think once you have actually, um, I guess, it's a confidence thing. Once you're confident that you know the story and the characters and they're going to you know, it's, it's like, hey, um, I can see Vegas. We're gonna get there. It's right there. I see the lights and everything. I'm in Barstow. I'm uh, right, I'm in Barstow, <laughs> there it is, right? That's like the most exciting uh -huh. part. There's a little bittersweet thing. It's great to finish. Like, yes, of course you love to finish, but there's a little bittersweet thing to finishing. It's sort of like finishing a good book. You're like, oh my God, <laughs> it's over. Right. Now what am I gonna do? Okay. Is there more than, no, it's over. It's over, <laughs> you know, right, Like it's right. done. So there's a little bit of uh, something that, you know, and, and I think people feel that when they read a really good book yeah. and they're just like, wow, do I, I'm not gonna see those characters again and that was amazing and, but it's done. I know writers who are incredibly successful who outline. I know writers who are extremely successful who don't outline. So what I would say is, um, if you always want to outline and you feel like you'd be lost if you didn't outline, you should learn a process where you don't outline to see where that takes you. Usually you're going to do your best work. Not necessarily always, but you should try that. If you're someone that just likes to wing it and you're like, if I have an outline, I don't even want to write it. Like to me, it's all about the joy of the discovery. You should outline before you write to try it. Not, not for the rest of your, to try it. It's, it's really frustrating because, you know, writing is a creative, well, it should be a creative pursuit. And like, when you're around young kids uh, before they get damaged, like, they play with such innocence and joy and spontaneity. And they don't live in a world of shoulds. They don't live in a world of rules. They just live in a world of, I'm a pirate and you're this, you're this, I'm on that. And just, it's just spontaneous and it, that is so, human and so captivating. Yeah, they're, they're, their stories are simple because they're young children, but they're, they're full of joy and authenticity. And then we just get damaged as we grow up and we get these negative messages and we get criticized and we, and we start being told what we should do and what we have to do and what the rules are. And if you don't follow the rules, ooh, you're in trouble. And that just kills creativity. So your process, explore it open-heartedly. What if a writer does not know if they're a conceptual writer or an intuitive writer? Yeah, great question. So I can, I can tell in 10 seconds, but I've been doing this a while. So what I'll do is, well, I can tell by reading, it, but that's not gonna be helpful to the writer. The writer can't necessarily read it. But here's what a writer can do. So I'll, I'll ask a writer a question. So that I can tell from a writer and I haven't read their writing. So what I'll do is, um, now they have to have written at least a script. So I'll say, let's talk about the last script you wrote. Uh, Why did you write it? You know, what was your inspiration? What was your jumping off point? What did you get excited about? And just listen, and I can tell in 10 seconds. So if it's a conceptual writer, 
First of all, they're going to be answering from just their voice. It's going to be answering from the more analytical, intellectual part of the brain, and you just can hear that. But also, they're going to be talking about uh, they started with an idea, a concept. Ooh, no one's done a thriller where, you know, or this I thought would be a really good comedy. Or they'll talk about, oh, a twist ending they had, um, or an opening story stuff. Or they might be talking about world. Conceptual writers love world building. So could be world building, could be a concept, an idea, part of a story, a beginning, a twist ending, a this, a con that's. Now when you, when you talk to an intuitive writer, they're going to be talking about it from a more emotionally authentic, vulnerable place. And they're almost always going to say, well, so there's this character, you know, and it, it, it's a character. Or, or it's something personal. And they might be able to say, like, I worked with a writer once and she's like, yeah, I just went through this really painful divorce. And uh, I either just cry myself to sleep every night and drink or I could write about it. Okay, so that's an intuitive writer. Or sometimes they don't even know. They'll say, I don't know. And they're almost embarrassed. But like, I had to write this. I, I just had to write this. That's an intuitive writer. So what is your inspiration? What got you excited? Another thing I'll ask is, okay, so when you're working on this script, was there ever a point where you got in a, like it got tough, like you, you got lost or you, you, you didn't know what to do? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. And I go, what did you do? And you know, an intuitive writer, they are, they're going to find the solution in the character and just what feels right. And the conceptual writer is like, well, I thought, you know, for the someone who reads it, it'd be good if this happens. And they're just coming at it from a completely different space. Now, just to confuse this for a moment, I always get in my workshops, I get, I'd say 90% of the writers, within a few weeks, they know they're conceptual or intuitive. And there's no gender to this. I mean, I have equal amount of conceptual writers who are men and women, same with intuitive. But there's always like one or two or three writers who will say, I'm so confused. Um, I really thought I was intuitive because this, but then I thought I was conceptual. When I do this exercise, I feel like I'm both, but I don't think I do either that great. Exactly. There's a small percentage of writers, I call them slidable. So if you think about like the um, conceptual and the intuitive, and most people, obviously, unless you've had like brain damage, you have access to both parts and you use different parts. You know, when you sleep, you're using your intuitive. When you're solving math, you're doing the conceptual. Um, but most people will hang out here as a writer or hang out here. But there's some small percent of writers that just slide back and forth, back and forth. So they're like, oh yeah, I thought it was, no, I thought it was this. And they, they're like kind of equally comfortable they just slide back and forth, but they're not strong enough in either space. So they will just pick one space, stay there, get really strong at it, and then go over here and get really strong at this. If you are slidable, you should celebrate because that's the hardest part. So I'm, I'm a diehard conceptual writer. So when I was doing this training, it was so hard to turn off the conceptual brain. It was so hard to go over here. And when I was over here, at some point, I'd have a conceptual thought or a conceptual concern, and I'd just go, Voom! and I would just stay here. Um, I had to learn how to slide back and forth effortlessly. That's the hardest thing for me to teach someone. And some people naturally do it. I don't know why, but they do. So it's possible someone listening to this, they answer the questions that I ask, and they're like, I kind of think I'm both. That is possible. But you might need to get stronger at one or both sides.